India's market news headquarters. Cutting edge analysis. Influential insights. Market moving intelligence. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. Thursday morning, we are coming to you as always from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. Uh, it's going to be an interesting day. Lots of pulls and pushes. US markets ending slightly lower. It's a holiday. I mean, actually, US is out for the rest of the week. So, uh, you know, we perhaps will be operating in a bit of a vacuum as we come back tomorrow and maybe into today as well. I'm Prashant with me, my colleagues Nigel and Survey. Guys, hi, good morning. Hi, morning, folks. Uh, not looking too bad. I mean, the market's been consolidating. It's been holding the recent lows. 24,000 has sort of so far... Uh, you know, been lasting on the street as well. And I guess the, the queues are not too bad. I mean, maybe we don't have a roaring rally on Wall yeah. Street, but I, I think it's been uh, pretty okay so far. Well, despite uh, no roaring rally, I think the queues are stacked heavily in favor of the bulls. And I think it has the makings of a good couple of sessions. So let's see how it goes. Uh, you know, it hasn't been too bad off late, but, uh, you know, it has the makings of a couple of good, good, good trading sessions. The market sessions. did very well yesterday. Yes. And I think maybe uh, Nifty will pick up as well. So 24,350 is that level. Let's see if we're able to get to that or not. But levels come a little later. Let's pick up from where, of course, US markets left off. So as I said, I mean, slightly weaker. You had the S&P down about 0.4%, NASDAQ down 0 06 uh, And actually, you know, NVIDIA was down 1.5%. I mean, the importance of NVIDIA has become so large that one and a half, four percent cut, the rest of the chip stocks all sell off, and that's the largest weight down on the S&P. Uh, it's a U.S. Thanksgiving holiday, so NYSE, NASDAQ, bond markets, everything is shut later today. I mean, there is no U.S., uh, so as to speak. Uh, today, and then, of course, I mean, I think tomorrow as well, it's a half a day. Uh, for, I mean, anybody of size, any large institutional investor perhaps is out for the week already. So, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, in, in that sense, it's a bit of a vacuum as you trade today's session and, of course, come back tomorrow. Uh, you also had numbers from Dell last night. Numbers were disappointing, especially in the revenue. Stock was down about 12%. I'll come to some of the macro indicators. 10-year yield down about six basis points. So there was a sharp sell-off, 4.25%. The dollar index was down sharply as well. And I think uh, we need to note this. Uh, but, you know, I was making this point yesterday during Asian session as well. It's things like uh, the Japanese yen, the New Zealand dollar, and a couple of other things as well. I mean, actually, you, you, uh, even something like the Mexican peso against the dollar, the Canadian dollar, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a reaction function. So when you look at the dollar index, remember that it's a combination of all of this, and JPY especially has got a large move. By the way, the JPY closed with a 151 handle, and it, it was as high as 155. Well, I, actually, I should say the cross was as low as 155. So 155 to 151 uh, within this week. Uh, so that's a very large move on a currency like US, US dollar, uh, 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 Japanese yen. Uh, and maybe there is more strength here for the Japanese yen. Uh, so December meeting, will the Bank of Japan be hawkish? Will there perhaps be some move? I think we'll need to wait and watch. Uh, in terms of U.S. economic data, I mean, there are a plethora of uh, indicators, but I'm not really uh, stressing on it because it did not have really that much of a price implication, market implication. Inflation was in line. Uh, you had stable claims, uh, personal consumption data slightly softer, and incomes were stronger. Uh, oil prices are flat, just under $73 a barrel uh, this morning, so no change, absolutely flat. Uh, in terms of nominations from the uh, incoming president, U.S. Pre uh, president-elect Trump, You've got one more nomination. I think this is important, right? I mean, widespread expectation that uh, Trump on day one, as he's promised, will put the Ukraine-Russia war and, and bring it to a close. So he's nominated uh, a gentleman called uh, Keith Kellogg. He's essentially a former army general. Uh, and he's uh, sort of publicly in the past, Mr. Kellogg has called for cutting military aid to Ukraine. His argument is that this war is being sustained only because the West and NATO and especially U.S. is funding Ukraine with missiles, with arms, armaments, and of course, money as well. And he's called uh, for cutting that aid off to uh, Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of in line with expectations of Trump's promise to end that conflict as well. Now, uh, just to sort of uh, circle back and tie in the levels here, Nifty yesterday, I mean, actually three days now, it's faced selling pressure around the 40-day exponential moving average. That number is about 24,350. Uh, we uh, almost got to it once again for the third time this week and then sold off uh, from there. So that's the first kind of target to take out, right? 24,350. Let's uh, hopefully 
I mean, that comes into view and we close above it. Once you close above it, I mean, then we'll talk about the 50% and the 61.8% retracement of the fall that we've seen from the all-time high to the recent low. Uh, and you'll start talking about levels like 24, I think 660 and beyond. But let's just get past this hump first. Supports come in for the Nifty at about 24,125. For the Nifty Bank, resistance zone is 52,680, which is, by the way, the 61.8% retracement, and 52,817, which is the low, uh, the swing low before that, uh, before the market actually broke down a little bit more. So that is the resistance zone for the Nifty. Uh, I mean, numbers have not changed because these are not moving averages. We put these levels out earlier as well. But so far, Bank Nifty has failed to get to these numbers. Supports come in at the 40 uh, hourly exponential, which is 51,698. So very near-term structure is what we are looking at. FIs were buyers yesterday for the second day in a row, not counting, I mean, the prior day when there was that MSCI-related inflow. Uh, so two days in a row, a very small number. But... I mean, at least they're not sellers. And I think that in the margin is the silver lining as well. Gift Nifty should indicate how the start is likely to be. It's about 20, 22 odd points higher. Uh, broader markets, mid cap, small caps, lots of action. Yesterday, the mid cap index ended 0.8% higher. The small cap index was up about one and a third of a percent. So single stocks, I think, are also going to be in focus. We'll come to that a little later. Sirbi. Well, absolutely. Uh, by the way, I uh, guess uh, what started moving higher while the equity market was cooling off in the US, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah, oh, you guessed it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the crypto market has added, maybe trying to get into a bit of holiday cheer. Mm -hmm. And let's see if it can, uh, you know, cross that milestone, 100,000, right? We're back to the countdown. Uh, this morning, prices are around uh, 96,500 on the big Bitcoin. It's about a 5 6% surge. Anyway, uh, in terms of U.S. market action, along with a lot of the other data points that came through, for instance, inflation, et cetera, which were in line with estimates, there was also the second reading of the U.S. GDP number, the third quarter GDP number, and that was in line with estimates. About 2.8% was the rise. So it's telling us that the U.S. economy continues to chug along quite nicely. And consumer spending, which is, of course, one of the largest contributors to that GDP number, that did really well. Consumer spending is up about 3.5% in that GDP print. So looking very, very solid and strong. And it's expected to pick up as, you know, you get into holiday season, full throttle sales are supposed to be really good. Uh, of course, today there's uh, no trade because of Thanksgiving. And even tomorrow, there's only a half a day session. So therefore, volumes are likely to be very light throughout. So you'll uh, really get a, a clearer, decisive move in the US market now only on Monday. Uh, coming across to Asia, uh, yesterday we had that surprise 50 basis points rate cut from the Bank of New Zealand and now it's Korea that's moved. South Korea, uh, the bank, uh, central bank there has cut uh, rates by 25 basis points. GDP growth has been faltering in South Korea, so we've got some rate action over there. Uh, but otherwise, markets are actually range-bound. If you're looking at Asian markets, let's see if we can get some of them up for you on the screen. The Hong Kong market, for instance, has been down a little bit. Even mainland China is a little weak. Uh, there's a little bit of green on some of the uh, other regional markets like Australia. Uh, the Nikkei is managing about a you know less than half a percent increase. A mixed picture not a very clear directional universal move in Asia. That's what we have. The good news for us really is the fact that consolidation here in India has been happening with a very clear upward bias. The lows are holding. And for the third day running, the Nifty is above the 24,000 mark. In fact, you know, we've seen a pickup every time there is a major dip. And uh, mid caps are really outperforming as well. The flows picture yesterday, now it's a very small, mild buy, just about eight crores of uh, net buy number from the FBIs. Uh, domestic institutions, remember yesterday they were on the sell side, but again, uh, so day before they were on the sell side, but yesterday they cam came back on the buying side of the screen. So that's good news as well. Let's see if the FBI, you know, selling at least is over, then the bulls will take that with both hands. Watch out for the CapEx side of the market once again, because interest is coming back into these names. We saw the JP Morgan report on defense, for instance, and the meter is on. Uh, whether it's a project awards or order wins, companies are constantly announcing this. So you'll hear that from KC International today. Wari's announced some orders. Uh, stocks like Hoodco, NBCC, all of them announcing fresh work and fresh projects. So uh, perhaps this part of the market will continue to be active. But yeah, it's, it's been good going for the last uh, for the last couple of days, at least this week for the market. Nigel. Well, one would say that FIs have net bought only 8 crores. Why are yeah. you getting so excited? It's better than them selling 800 crores <laughs> and selling 8,000 crores. Exactly. So thank God for soft, <laughs> small mercies. Yeah. Uh, you know, and things have suddenly started looking pretty good. Yeah. The FI is selling, that has subsided. You have the dollar index that's cooled off. And in fact, you have the ruling NDA government that's looking much stronger post that Maharashtra win. So things looking good on the domestic front. Even globally overnight, the dollar index cooled off a little bit. Brent crude prices well behaved. The yields as well have cooled off. So in that case, though the US markets ended with a bit of red, 
That's a very, very uh, good cues for us when we open up uh, today. Moving to the November series. Today is the last day of the November series and what a volatile one it's been, right? It's been quite nervous actually from the, for the bulls because we made the high earlier on in the series and then in fact we corrected closer to 1,000 points or thereabouts. Now we're closer to the upper end of uh, the, uh, the range for the series. And can we end the series with a flourish? The cues suggest that maybe that could be possible as well. Looking at the rollovers, the nifty rollovers, well, they're more or less in line. Normally, on an average, for the last few sessions, it's been, last few series, it's been around 58, 59% or thereabouts, so more or less in line out there. But, uh, you know, the, the uh, nifty bank, you know, that one, in fact, the rollovers have been a little higher. The nifty bank rollovers have been around 77%, which is higher than what we have seen on an average. Moving to the FI data points, well, the long positioning, close to 15,000 contracts were added yesterday by the FIs. Shorts, more than longs, they continue to remain net short with close to 65% of their positionings on the short side. The big question is, the last few days, we have gone to 24,350, and we have not been able to clock that mark, you know, to cross that mark. Just take a look at that. Last three trading sessions, almost every day we have gone over there, but we have slipped a little bit from the top. Now, today, the scenario is such that we have expiry day that will play out. You also have queues that are heavily stacked in favor of the bulls. So hopefully we can get past the sum and then look at higher levels. The 20 DMA becomes a reference point on the downside. And what's changed over the last few trading sessions is both the pillars of the market have started doing well. Reliance Industries, it made a low closer to around the 1200 rupee mark out and that's bounced back. And HDFC Bank as well. That's suddenly become the leader because in the last few sessions, HDFC Bank has got its mojo bank. It's make, uh, made a fresh 52 big high as well. While Reliance Industries, from around that 1200 rupees or thereabouts, you know, it's, uh, it's not breaking lower levels, which is good news. You like both these two solid weights to continue with good gains because that's more than 20% of the index. So the queue stacked in favor of the bulls. Let's see whether or not we can end the series with a flourish. Okay, all right. So that's what we have in terms of, uh, you know, the trading setup and the queues today. Uh, let's get uh, the party started, so to speak, with the equity call of the morning. As always, we have Mixo Das of JP Morgan, who believes that Asian equities are poised to gain into early 2025, given, number one, the better growth momentum until tariffs hit through a combination of China stimulus and front-loading of trade. And number two, improving AI sentiment as focus shifts from capabilities to workflow solutions. And number three, US exceptionalism being perhaps the most consensus trade among investors. And point number four, positive seasonality around the year end. So expecting a good end to the year on equities. Okay, well, let's get uh, Matt Orton in, Chief Market Strategist at Raymond James Investment. Uh, Matt, good to have you with us here on the phone line today. Uh, you know, the appointment of Keith Kellogg in the U.S. as a special envoy to Ukraine, Russia. I mean, should we read that as, tr as, as, as a move forward by Trump in fulfilling his promise on ending that war? Hey, good morning, Prashant. Always good to, to join you, even if by phone this morning. And I think it's, it's a reaffirmation of his commitment of the promises that he ran on during the election. So I think part of trying to resolve a number of these geopolitical conflicts is, is embodied in that. But I, I don't think it should be taken as we're just going to walk out and end the war. I think there's, there's still going to be conflict. Trump still has to come into office. He still has to actually take the seat, get into the role. And so I think what it does highlight is that we're working to end potentially some of these geopolitical conflicts around the world which is a good thing, I think, for overall stability. And when you look at what that means for the broader market, when you look at his, the totality of Trump's cabinet picks overall and all of his appointments, I think it highlights that he is going to fulfill a number of the campaign promises that he has. So the idea around deregulation, the ideas around cutting taxes and making sure that we do have corporate and individual tax cuts that are put in, that we're going to have tariffs, but hopefully tariffs to bring people to the negotiating table. I think all of that is being set right now. So I think that's generally positive for the cyclical trade that we've seen in the overall market. And so when I talk to clients, the main message is take all of this as trying to fill in some of those known unknowns we have out there about what his cabinet, what his administration might look like, and lean into some of those themes that have been working already because I think they will continue to work going forward. And, and especially that idea of U.S. exceptionalism, I think that continues uh, to play out. Uh, Matt, hi. Uh, good to have you on the show today. So as we're getting to the end of the year, 
we here in India are just happy that foreigners aren't selling as much over here, right? Because uh, we've had a ton of foreign selling hitting us over the last two months. We're hoping December is going to be different. What's your sense and what's the chatter you hear around India now after this correction? Yeah, I think, Serbia, I think there's, at least on my part, you know, I've certainly been an India bull for, for a long time. And in, I, I get a positive reception from clients when I talk about India. And I actually think the Trump victory is beneficial to India because when you look at how you might hedge your portfolio against tariff risk, how you might hedge your correlation to the S&P 500 or that idea of U.S. exceptionalism, how you might hedge it relative to friendshore and nearshoring, India comes up. In every single one of those conversations, you have an economy that has very robust secular growth drivers that's just pulled back over 10 percent and looks to be stabilizing a little bit. Meanwhile, China, like we've talked about in the past, has been a perennial disappointment, and it's just continued to happen again and again. So I think foreign investors who left India to move to China have been burned a little bit. And I think as the Indian market starts to hopefully gain some more positive momentum into the end of the year, I would think FII buying is going to continue to pick up. I know I've been looking to add to positioning as we've seen some of these bounces in the market because mm -hmm. it's a great ballast to a U.S. portfolio. And India is still, I think, a, my biggest overweight from an international perspective. So Santa Claus could be coming to town very soon here uh, in Mumbai, in India. I'd like to add, <laughs> uh, add some romance to that. You know, it appears the FI fling with the Chinese are over, and now they're back <laughs> to the true love, which is India. You know, and as Matt has been saying, he's been the big bull on, uh, on India as well. Every time you've spoken about, you've been telling us that India is the top bet. So that's good news, Matt, and uh, hopefully the stars align as well. And we see high levels here in the Indian markets. But you've never st stopped short of giving us, you know, stocks that you like. I think the last time around you were speaking about some auto names you liked. You liked ICIC, Bank Infosys. Anything fresh that you've added? Yeah. So, you know, with the pullback we've had in the market, I've actually um, really taken a liking to Bharti Airtel. Um, that's been a really prime asset that's just, in my opinion, been a little bit expensive. Uh, and the pullback we've had in the market has made it a very attractive entry point. I mean, you've got the second largest Indian telecom operator with a growing wireless customer base in Africa. Uh, you've seen revs continue to increase. Your average revenue per user growth is strong. Margin expansion is driving the growth forward with 2G to 4G upgrades. So I think you have a very good asset similar to like ICICI bank being the prime asset in the financial space. I think Barty Airtel to me is a prime asset in the telecom space that has a number of growth tailwinds with tariff hikes as well. So that's the name on the pullback that I've certainly uh, been looking at and that I think looks attractive going forward. Uh, Matt, before we let you go, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think one of our earlier conversations uh, a month or so back, I remember you saying that you like Adani Ports as well. Now, a lot has happened once again with the group in the last couple of days. Any thoughts? Yeah, it has. Obviously, you know, I'm encouraged by the fact all of the news that came out of the U.S. Um, hasn't led to more FII selling. That was one worry that I had. Uh, I think Donnie Ports is, you know, needs to be looked at separately. It's a name I wouldn't be adding to positioning right now simply because there's, there's still some hair on the story. But it's not one I would be selling at these lows because, again, it plays into the infrastructure theme. There are very real strong fundamental drivers that are not at all tied to the issue that the DOJ is investigating. So I think once there's some more clarity, once we get through another earnings season, I think buying the dip could be attractive, assuming that they continue to deliver strong results. All right. All right. Um, uh, just good to get that perspective from you. Thanks very much for joining in. You have a good rest of the day. That's a view from Matt Orton coming in. Let's quickly tell you what are the other conversations lined up on the show today. Lots of action as always. Coming up at 8.35, we'll have uh, Pradeep uh, Kheruka of Borussel Renewables joining in as China cuts uh, export rebates to manufacture uh, PV products from the 1st of December. So we'll talk about the implications. At 9 a.m., we'll have Amit Anwani of Prabhudhas Liladhar talking about key trends in the defence sector. At 9.20, Madhu Kela is the market master of the day. We'll get some perspective going with him. At 9.30, the management of Prestige Group will be joining in. Morgan Stanley has downgraded the stock to an underweight from an overweight. Uh, we'll find out what the business trends are like with Mr. Irfan Razak. Following that, uh, we'll have uh, K. Ajit Kumar Rai of Suprajit Engineering chatting with us and giving us the business outlook uh, in the second half of the year. 
the company has of course signed an MOU with a Japanese cable maker as well. So we'll talk about that. At 9.50, we'll have Horma Sarabji of Autocar India and MP Sham of uh, Akshaya Motors to discuss the recent launches we've seen from Mahindra and Mahindra as well as Ola Electric. So we'll uh, find out more about both of those segments. Towards the end of the show, our special segment, It's the Economy, coming up. Lata today will uh, chat up with uh, Samir Goel of uh, Deutsche Bank and talk about uh, the rally in the dollar index, whether that's peaked and what next for bond yields. Short break, but we have lots of stock specific action to track for you when we get back in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at Vedanta, Indian Overseas Bank, Sonata Software, Natco Pharma, PCBL, KEC, Hudco, as well as NBCC. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow, while Goldrich Properties and Colgate will be reacting to negative news flow. Go into that break, come back, we'll get into deeper detail on all of these names. Welcome back. Well, uh, markets across Asia continue to trade mixed. The bulls here will be hoping to build on some of the gains that we've seen yesterday, 20 points higher at the implied open. So let's uh, talk about individual stocks now that we need to focus on. Our team is standing by with the CNBC TV 18 list of top stocks to watch, guys. A good morning to all of you. Uh, Abhishek, let's start off with uh, Godrish Properties. Some fundraising happening here. Uh, well, uh, sources tell CNBC TV18 that Godrej uh, Properties has launched a QIP to raise about uh, rupees 4,000 crore. So uh, the indicative price is about 2,595 per share, which is at a discount of 8.5% to yesterday's closing price and about 5% to, uh, you know, uh, the uh, 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 semi flow price. Uh, the 5.5% uh, uh, equity dilution is seen over there. The use of proceeds is for acquiring uh, land or land development rights as as well as development rights directly or indirectly, as well as the fact uh, general corporate purpose. So lock-in period is about 30 days for the investors and the BRLM to the issue are Kochak Mahindra Capital, Boffa Securities, Jefferies as well as Morgan Stanley. Uh, just to alert our viewers, uh, you know, Goddard's Properties had taken a board approval to raise funds via equity or debt of up to rupees 6,000 crore. Uh, this was done on 1st of October. Back to you. All right, thanks a lot for that, Abhishek. Well, uh, let's move on to uh, Manglam, who's joining in to tell us about Colgate. Manglam, tell us more. Well, yesterday was the analyst meet of Colgate, and there the company said that rural growth, which is doing better than urban, has witnessed some moderation recently. And that's a bit of a worry, largely because up until now, you know, even as urban growth was challenged, rural growth was outpacing that. Some moderation in that means demand is slightly weak. Add to that, you know, gross and EBITDA margins will normalize from FY24 levels, which were an anomaly for the company as input costs have begun to rise as well. And over the last three or four quarters, remember, growth has been more volume-led. The company believes that going forward, this balance will shift between growth, uh, uh, you know, in terms of volume and price and mix. So that's something we'll watch out for as well, which means that the revenue growth will be led more by pricing mix as against just volumes itself. The company has done well in this year when it comes to market share gains and premium portfolio doing well. And their key priorities remain intact where they will drive per capita oral care consumption, premiumization, category growth in toothbrushes through devices, but more importantly, building diversification through palm olive as well. But the very near term moderation in rural demand is something that the street could take note of. The stock opens in the red to start with and thereafter, we'll see where it goes. All right, uh, Mangalan, thank you very much uh, for that. Well, uh, Vedanta, IOB and Sonata Software are stocks we want to focus on. Vamakshi is telling us why. Vamakshi, morning. Well, good morning, Prashant. Let me first start off with Vedanta. Modi's rating has upgraded the corporate family rating of Vedanta Resources following its successful liability management exercises. Now, uh, the rating has been upgraded from B3 to B2 and therefore I'm going with the green for Vedanta because Vedanta Resources being in better shape bodes well for Vedanta uh, Limited, which is the listed company and also has the potential to lower cost of borrowing and lower risk at the promoter's end. So therefore, going with the green for Vedanta. Indian Overseas Bank also going with the green for this counter because there's another up rating upgrade out here as well. Ikra has upgraded its rating from Ikra AA- minus to AA. ICRA has also revised its outlook from positive to stable and the uh, rationale behind this given by the credit rating agency is that uh, the company has uh, you know, demonstrated sustained improvement in its profitability, capital position as well as solvency profile. This again bodes well from a cost of funds perspective. <coughs> Lastly, keep an eye out on Sonata Software. They've won a multi-million dollar modernization deal in Australia from a global leader in access solutions. Sonata Software is expected to support the client's uh, rollout of digital transformation initiatives across 30 
13 countries in the APAC region. Now, keep in mind that the deal was secured in the first quarter and was mentioned during the earnings call as well, but overall going with the green for this counter as well. Okay, all right, got it. Uh, thanks for that, Pamakshi. Uh, KEC, NBCC, Hutko, all of these companies are announcing order wins or new projects. Vivek has the details. Good morning, Vivek. Well, good morning, absolutely right. So, KEC International, you know, one more set of orders that the company has got this time around is from Prague Grid and it's for a turnkey order of a little over 1700 crores, the value of this particular order. Order has been received in the transmission and distribution segment of the company. So, KEC will be designing, supplying, and installing 75 kilowatt transmission lines as well as GIC, GIS substations. Order book, remember, for the company at the end of Q2 was in excess of 34,000 crore. Now, both Hutco as well as NBCC will be in focus. Uh, NBCC has signed a MOU with Hutco for development of a 10-acre institutional plot in Noida. Uh, Hutco intends to create an institutional complex over here, and the project will have 8.7 lakh you know, square feet of built-up area. NBCC will be the project management consultant. Uh, there will be a concept of concept to commissioning will completely be undertaken by NBCC. What is the tentative cost of the project? 600 crore. So some positive news are coming in for both of these names as well. All right, uh, Vivek, thank you very much uh, for that. More stocks with news flow. Vinny is here with details. Vinny, morning. Good morning. So, a couple of stocks on the radar. We have Natco Pharma. We're expecting green year after uh, the company has sold a land of around 14.3 acres at a price of around 116 crores. So, keeping an eye on that because we're still waiting out for details of the buyers that's not yet released. Uh, also, what we're watching out for uh, is in terms of what is going to be the use in terms of the money that they are receiving. Though the company has highlighted that this land is not sold to any promoter, promoter group or any related parties. So, keeping an eye on uh, Natco Pharma, expecting green year. PCBL also, we expect green the government has allotted around 116 uh, acres of land uh, government of andhra pradesh that has uh allotted this land to the company. Uh, this approval is going to be a bit on a contingent basis depending on its investment plan that, that is outlined, how are they following through with it, as well as in terms of the employment commitments that they've made. Uh, as of now, what we understand is that PCBL is planning to invest around 3,700 crores in this project, uh, and which is expected to generate a direct employment of around 200 individuals. So yes, if they meet through this, then this allotment is going to be uh, going to be carried forward. But as of now, PCBL in green is what we're expecting. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for that, Vinny. So let's quickly recap our list of stocks to watch. The ones that have positive news flow around them are Vedanta, Indian Overseas Bank, Sonata Software, Natco, Pharma, PCBL, KC International, Hotco, and NBCC. The ones that have negative news around them today are Godrich Properties on the back of the QIP as well as Colgate. Okay, so that's the stock list for the morning. Let's now move on and take stock of all the commodity action. Manisha is with us as always. Manisha, we are watching the Bitcoin again, but <laughs> what else? What else is uh, top of mind today? Oh, well, yes. Uh, Bitcoin, definitely, because we've seen prices start to gain there yet again. But, you know, in various various uh, commodities, there's a bit of a profit taking that we have seen continuing today as well. The crude prices have declined for a third straight day. There is buildup in U.S. gasoline inventories. And now the markets will watch out for Sunday. That is when you have the OPEC and Allies meeting with an expectation that you could be looking at a third time postponement in sense of output hikes there. Uh, in the other markets, you have seen decline come in for silver prices. That fell 1% overnight. Uh, from a lakh rupees of an all-time high, silver is now trading at 88,000. And the prices can decline from here as well, the way the markets are going. So some more profit-taking anticipated onto that one. The base metal prices in the meanwhile overall have seen a bit of a pullback. That is because there is a decline in U.S. dollar. There is rising cost at mines, fall in inventories. All of that has been supportive. And while the street awaits details on the U.S. plans on tariffs, there also is an expectation yet again that China could be coming out with more stimulus is the reason you're looking at zinc, copper, aluminum, all of that trading in positive. Okay. Well, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. So that's uh, commodities in focus. We take a break. Deepan Mehta, Director of Elixir Equities, will be joining us with some fundamental stock conversation. Stay tuned. That's coming up. Welcome back. You're tuned in to Bazaar Morning Call. Well, let's get in Deepan Mehta from uh, Alexa Equities who joins us on the show. Hi, Deepan. Good morning. Good to see you, Ben. 
Well, what about the EV scooter? Are you excited about it? Yesterday, that was a top mover. Solid volume, stock ended circuit 20% up. Ola Electric, does it come on your radar or you choose to skip it? Yeah, good morning, Nigel. Thank you for having me on your show. The question which came to my mind is, are they going to make profit at that price point? Mm -hmm. uh, see, as it is, uh, making money out of EVs is a very, very tough challenge, not just in uh, two-wheelers, but also in four-wheelers. Uh, they need the cost of inputs to come down significantly and to get massive scale to get the profitability going. And in that, they are moving down the line, reducing the price point. I don't know how Ola will make profit uh, on such products. And I would avoid Ola Electric completely. I think uh, competition is there in the industry. It's not one of its kind. And uh, there is no real clear roadmap to when it will turn solid into profitability, uh, whether sales need to grow two, three times uh, before it can cover all its fixed costs. So I would avoid Ola Electric, certainly sentimentally positive, and may go towards increasing their monthly volume sales market share as well. But as fundamental investors, we need to focus on uh, profitability, and that I don't see happening in Ola Electric for a long time. Mm, okay. <clears throat> So, uh, not yet biting uh, when it comes to Ola. Deepan, hi, morning. What about Swiggy? It's, uh, it's been making interesting moves, right? I mean, uh, since listing, suddenly there's some momentum that's picking up. Either Swiggy or Zomato, uh, did you, do you like either? Uh, yeah, so good morning. <clears throat> so, first of disclosure, we are invested in uh, uh, Zomato. And I think uh, investors who had FOMO over Zomato may be buying into Swiggy. And certainly there's an arbitrage opportunity. As of now also, it is at a 35-40% discount to Zomato. So some amount of catch-up is necessary to take place. And growth rates, <clears throat> excuse me, growth rates at both companies are more or less similar. Prospects are similar. And, uh, you know, the future forecast for the sector is very rosy. So from that point of view, you may see, uh, you know, further sentimental improvement and buying in Swiggy. But as investors in Zomato, I wouldn't do the switch at all. And from a fresh investment perspective, also on both stocks, I would just wait and watch purely because we are slightly cautious on the market. And high PE stocks, I think, uh, may be targeted if the market drifts further lower. Mm. Uh, no, uh, point taken. Yeah. <clears throat> Deepan, you know, uh, talking about all these new age companies and also maybe uh, we were talking about Ola. You saw that, uh, I don't know if you saw that tweet uh, or with uh, Maya Soshi, uh, uh, saw so, so on a soft bank uh, with uh, his uh, investi companies. There was Bhavish Agarwal, there was also Vijay Shekhar Sharma, and of course, a lot of the other Delhi founders uh, uh, as well. Paytm is what I want to uh, talk about, uh, Deepan. Any thoughts? I mean, that's been a huge outperformer from the lows. I mean, if you look at it like that, from 350, it's come up to about 950 very quickly. Uh, is it pricing oh, in that, uh, uh, you know, all the repair recovery or there is more? <clears throat> yeah. I think the view which I have for Zomato and Swiggy holds for Paytm also. I think the rally has certainly taken out uh, a lot of the gains uh, which were expected post uh, all the challenges the company has faced. And I think uh, in terms of valuation, it is still quite expensive. So I would just wait and watch in Paytm, but existing investors can remain invested. Okay, all right. So uh, new age companies get the thumbs up from Dipin. Uh, Deepan, uh, stay on. Uh, another interesting space, obviously, is the renewable space. We're going to talk to you, talk to you about a renewables company in just a bit. But first, let's get uh, some clarity from the management. The company in focus is Borosil Renewables. Now, China has cut the tax rebate for uh, manufacturers of PV <coughs> products from the 1st of December. The rebate has not been entirely taken away, but it's come down from, I think, 13% to about 9%. To discuss the implications and what this means for the uh, Indian renewable space and the solar value chain, uh, we have with us uh, Pradeep uh, Keruka, Executive Chairman at Borosil Renewables. Mr. Keruka, thank you very much. Uh, great to have you on. You know, before we talk about the China rebate, there's a fair amount of duty action that's happened here as well, right? The basic uh, customs duty that India has imposed, that's already come on stream, uh, 10%. And earlier in, in our earlier conversations, you did say that with this BCD coming in, it should give you some relief. Prices should start moving higher. There's also some talk of, I think, anti-dumping duty. So let's discuss the India duty action first and what this has meant for the business. So the India duty action is uh, more than anything else an indicator that the government of India means business. Insofar, uh, components are concerned. They had already signaled their uh, strong interest in um, developing an Indian ecosystem for the manufacture of solar modules by imposing a basic customs duty of 40% on the import of fully built up modules. 
and 25% on the import of solar cells. Uh, this is uh, going back now nearly two years. Uh, what they have done since then is that they have also imposed a basic customs duty on the import of solar glass. Um, An anti-dumping duty has been imposed on the import of aluminum. And uh, uh, we are now currently looking at an anti-dumping duty uh, to be imposed on the imports of solar glass on top of the basic customs duty. Um, therefore, I think the most important uh, there, there are two things. One is that the government is signaling an intent to uh, to help local industry to develop uh, away from the effects of artificial, artificially low prices, uh, you know, in, in, in the shape of dumping. Right. Uh, now, the second aspect of anti-dumping duty, which is very important, is that uh, the government has proposed a minimum import price. So that means uh, no matter how low the Chinese producer goes with his price, the difference between that price and the target price set by the government has to be uh, filled in by, by means of duty. So, so therefore, uh, what they have been doing so far, for example, when the 10% and uh, basic customs duty was announced on the 23rd of July, by the 7th of August, they had already reduced their prices to India, FOB prices by 15%. So uh, they go on reducing their prices uh, at, at this moment, they are probably selling glass at the price of the raw material and perhaps a little bit of the energy that is new needed to convert raw materials into, into glass. So with the minimum import price, it, it, the, the ability to dump will be severely curtailed. So, and sir, we that's what we are... Sir, yes. Yeah, that, that's what we're trying to understand mm -hmm. that at a ground level, what how much of a help has it been for solar glass um, what is this minimum import price right now and what would be the prevailing market prices? Uh, and sort of what does it mean for you in terms of pricing? Uh, have you been able to take any hikes at all with some of this duty cushion coming in now? Um, actually, I, uh, because they reduced their export prices, um, they sought to uh, they sought to equalize that. But what did happen in the quarter from July to September was that the Rate rates, which had earlier dropped uh, to to a low, uh, rose again. So from six hundred dollars, they went to two thousand, two thousand four hundred dollars. And when that happened, then of course, uh, you know the the delivered price rose, and therefore we were able to get a better realization in that quarter. Rate rates uh, seem to be uh, seems to have stabilized and slightly moving down again. So the landed price of the solar glass is uh, likely to go down as well, in which case we'll have to match it. But in the meantime, since the Ministry of Finance is uh, sitting on a proposal given by the Ministry okay, of ADB. Commerce for uh, anti-dumping duty for provisional implementation of a provisional duty, uh, if that kicks in, of course, again, there is going to be an improvement in the selling price. Mr. So Hiruka, that hi, is really the layer of land. Yeah. Uh, no, and that's very helpful. So one more layer of duty expected, right? You would expect that yes. uh, to come. The yes. ministry is considering it, as you're saying. Yes. You know, uh, from an investor uh, perspective, Mr. Kerogan, maybe an unfair question to you since you're running the business. How should we look at it? You know, some say, well, this is uh, this is an industry. If there were no uh, import, if there were not, not the, these duties were not present, I mean, you know, uh, competitively speaking, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's tough out there, and you'd agree, right? We've spoken about this over the last couple of years. Yes. Uh, yes, so, w how should one? Uh, and of course, now there is a there's a there's a change in uh, sort of geopolitics. New administration in the U.S. They're also ex uh, expected to increase tariffs, etc. So, just address that briefly, and also uh, tell us on in solar, glass, and modules. Uh, is there uh, overcapacity in India? Is there what's what's, what's the situation like? Yeah, we, we are hopelessly under capacity in solar glass. Okay. Uh, solar modules have risen from 15 gigawatts of uh, capacity to 75 gigawatts of capacity already today. And uh, the market is booming for solar modules as never before. Uh, there is another 75 gigawatts of solar module manufacturing capacity which has been announced. The total availability of glass today as we, as we stand is about 16 gigawatts. So there is already uh, there is already a requirement for more solar glass in India than we have. So there are lots of projects for nearly 50 gigawatts which are on hold. Uh, they are on hold because people like us who are the prime movers, the first movers in the business, uh, 
are not finding it competitive uh, to be able to sell our glass. Uh, I also want to deal with the word competitive. See, competition means somebody can do something better, lower, cheaper than you, and then he has every right to be able to sell at a lower price than you. The fact of the matter is that they are not competitive at all. They are subsidized. We are uh, we are more efficient than the Chinese in terms of glass making. We we have a lower cost of melting. We have a higher utilization of uh, machines. Uh, we we get two hundred eighty tons of glass from one production line. They get about two hundred and twenty. Uh, we are getting 1,200 kilocalories we spend per kilogram of glass melted. And they, they it costs them about 1,680 in the furnaces that they supply to India. So therefore, by no stretch of imagination, are they competitive? They are not. Uh, we would say that uh, uh, Indian industry is competitive, but if the government of China is going to subsidize the export prices, then there's little that we can do. That is what they have been doing around the world, by the way, for not, not just uh, targeting India. Yes. And uh, uh, the, it is in recognition of that that the government decided to import certain duties and uh, certain other non-tariff barriers like ALMM, et cetera, for solar modules. And uh, our understanding is if the government is considering to make these measures uh, 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 applicable to solar glass and other components as well. So... Uh, I, I believe that the government has recognized it's not a question of Indian industry not being competitive. It's a question of Indian industry being targeted by predatory pricing and mm -hmm. uh, then the need to develop Indian industry, which is uh, now squarely felt by the government of India. And uh, so I think we're moving in a direction where I'm yes. personally quite hopeful that uh, all necessary measures will be implemented to give us a... Uh, to give us a fair, uh, fair level playing field. Uh, see mm. what's happening with solar modules. Now, uh, the, the largest module manufacturer is earning 100 crores profit after tax every month. So, when we have that kind of, uh, we have that kind of profitability going, then obviously you're going to uh, spur manufacturing in India. And why should we not manufacture in India? We have all the raw materials. We need to import yes. absolutely nothing. We have highly skilled manpower. That there is yes. no reason for this product to be imported at all. So mm. uh, it, it is the only people who might be complaining are the users of the glass, because obviously it would uh, they, they have to pay a little bit more for the product. Uh, it would hurt them. But uh, by no means would it make any kind of dent in their profitability. It, it would just shave off a little bit of a couple of percent from their profitability. And, and that's all. Nothing more mm. than that. Uh, Mr. That, Keruka, uh, sorry, back. Mr. Keruka, yeah. yeah, no, no, absolutely, yeah. point taken. You Just to clarify, you said 17 gig, uh, se, uh, what are the uh, modules? Se, 17 more has been announced, 17, 17 gigawatt. Five, no, one second. Yeah. Module manufacturing capacity existing in the country today is 75 gigawatts per annum. Correct. Uh, it is going to go up to 150 gigawatts per annum within the next two years if everybody who has announced capacity comes up. Got now, it, got it. Having said that, the capacity for glass today, operational, is about 16 gigawatts. Now, if we look at all the announcements already made by various players, including money that has been sunk in, we, are, we can look forward to another 50 gigawatts of glass coming in to the country. So uh, we are all up and running, waiting to waiting to launch production in India. And, uh, uh, you know, everything is ready. Uh, but we just need to have uh, support. We have to have uh, support to make us viable. Yes. And that support seems to be forthcoming. Yes. Uh, we have to wait till the Ministry of Finance takes a decision and, right. and they, they, they decide what they have to do. All right. Hi, Mr. Karuka. Good morning. And you've explained that beautifully to us. You know, I recall in 2015-16, there was that uh, pitch for MIP on steel, and that helped the industry big time. And this time around, you're making a pitch as well. A couple yes. of, uh, uh, you know, questions on the MIP. What is the, you know, what is the proposal you'll have made to the centre with regard to MIP? By when do you expect to hear from them that amount of MIP? Because this will be an absolute number that you'll have been uh, rallying for. So if you could help us out to that. So uh, the date of the recommendation was the 5th of November, which okay. was issued by the Ministry of Commerce. And they have 90 days in which they have to take a call. I mean, the Ministry of uh, Finance. So that would mean the 5th of February, they need to take a call whether to accept, reject, or do whatever they want to do. Uh, it is their call. 
And yes, uh, I believe that uh, uh, that uh, so far the indications we are getting is that they are going to be uh, supporting it. But okay. uh, the, we have to wait and see. Until what's the we level, sir? So what's the level, this anti-dumping duty that you're asking for? Uh, how much will it have to be? And also please factor in the announcement that we just started with, that China, you're saying that the problem is China is giving way too much subsidy to, to its uh, manufacturers, right? Now, I think that's come down to some extent. 13% uh, export rebate has come down to 9%. Uh, does that sort of uh, help in any way? And what is the uh, specific ask on duty? By the way, the uh, rebate of 13% has come down to 9% in the case of glass. It has come down to zero in the case of aluminum. Okay. So now uh, exporters of the aluminum frames will get no rebate at all. Uh, whereas they continue to get 9% in the case of glass. It's a matter of time uh, and a matter of moment uh, what, what China does. Because uh, the fact is that, uh, uh, now this, this has nothing to do with me, but I, I do move around in certain circles and uh, the, the Chinese economy is not doing that well. Yeah. Uh, they have been reeling under shocks and I, I don't think this is a secret. So the government is uh, taking a very careful look on uh, what they wish to do in terms of okay. curbing expenditure and stopping subsidies and things like that. Uh, so if they feel that uh, despite all the subsidies that they have given, a country yes. like India has successfully been able to ramp up production and yes. uh, install capacity already in modules, in cells and so on, and yeah. uh, going full strength ahead with glass as well, uh, that the yeah. subsidies that they gave uh, ha don't seem to have worked. If All they right. have not worked, then why should they bleed themselves dry, giving subsidies yes. for products that in any case uh, might face uh, import resistance? Right. Uh, Mr. Ker in, in Mr. Country, Keruka? Yeah. Right. Mr. Keruka, very quickly, you know, your margins have improved on the standalone business from low single digits to around 18%. Very yes. quickly, if you could tell us, will the standalone business improve from here? And the X of the standalone business, which will be your European business, when does that turn profitable? Because as of now, it's still, uh, you know, uh, under big pressure. So you see, it's like this. Uh, let's uh, separate the two uh, the two things. Uh, if you're looking at our own business, uh, the, the Indian business, a standalone business, you know, we set up a new line, a new production line uh, yes. in January 2023. We've been running it for 18 months. In keeping with the Borosil tradition, uh, we use our own technology. So we've been fine-tuning that furnace, fine-tuning the production uh, capabilities. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the the consumption of raw materials. Uh, yes. From 37 percent, it's dropped down to 25 percent. Sorry, one second. Mm. Yeah, from 37 percent, it's dropped down to 25 percent. That is the the, the 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 value of raw materials used by us, and uh, also fuel efficiencies and so on. So that's one part of that. That's one part of our of our effort. Uh, the second thing is, like I said, the 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 quarter that just went by. Uh, we we got a big bump up because of the rise in ocean freight. Now, mm -hmm. ocean freight uh, actually rose yes. because shipping lines decided to withdraw the number of ships that were available uh, mm -hmm. in China for, for exports uh, because uh, the, they were losing got money it. at uh, the, the prices at which they have been shipping. So uh, there's a possibility that ocean freights will stay a little bit uh, higher. Okay. And uh, if they are a little bit higher than... Uh, that that would help us uh, in terms of yes. uh, the uh, the environment uh, with reference to China. Uh, we we are quite hopeful about the uh, the imposition of the minimum import price. To give you an idea, the, Mr. The Keruka, uh, the government uh, uh, is yeah, Mr. yes. Yeah, sorry, apologies. We just completely. If you can uh, wind up that point quickly, sir. We are just sort of uh, uh, hitting the next thing. Could you? Just, yeah, please go on. Just uh, wrap up that point, yeah, sir. So 56,000 rupees a ton is the fair price which has been seen by the government of India. And uh, uh, the, the, the glass was coming in at 38,000. And uh, then they dropped it to 28,000. So the, there is, uh, it, it is completely senseless because uh, uh, the prices of raw materials, are, they, they, these are international prices. And they have not dropped. So if they are, if they are shipping glass at 28,000, which should be costing them 56,000, that's at half the price. Now, now, you know, that's a straightforward government subsidy. And uh, if, if we have a minimum import price, we are able to get the same price uh, which, which we deserve. 
uh, and which is fair, then in that case, it just does not matter at what price they export. So th this should be a game changer if it comes through. All right. Uh, we'll leave it there, Mr. Karuka, and we'll talk to you once this comes in. 90 days from the 5th of November, 5th of Feb, uh, you know, uh, in the th next three months, we should probably hear something one way or the other. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We're going to come back more on the other side. Uh, there's about eight minutes to go for the pre-open. Welcome back. Well, how do you approach trade today? To help us out, we have Mitesh as well as Sudarshan. Morning, gentlemen. Mitesh, you go first. Now the Gift 50 is suggesting a 40-50 point uptake. Your view? Yeah. So, uh, good morning, Nigel. You know, we've been maintaining a positive bias and uh, suggesting a target of uh, 24 350, I think, which has been tested on nearly all the three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I think that remains the important pivot. Uh, having said that, I think the structure to me still remains positive, despite the fact that there was minor sell-off in the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, hour of the trade yesterday. I believe that we still have the chance to get back to 24.350. And once we cross this 20.30 point zone of 24.350 and 20 points higher, I think then we are looking at a test of 24.500. So the structure is positive. Uh, we have maintained a buy on decline strategy. The lower side range is about 24.150, 120. So around those levels, try and buy. Uh, on stocks, it will long bias and around 24 to 50 take some profits. Got it. All right. And Sudarshan, what about you? Yeah, good morning. Well, the view has been that the correction that we saw, that 3,000 point correction is probably over. That's what I explained yesterday. If that is over, then the original bull market resumes. That is the assumption on which we have to work. Now, the market has to prove us wrong by going below 23,200. This assumption is not correct. That's a far way. That's a long way. So we'll just leave it there. The trend is up. The correction is over. And now we should see a resumption of the bull market. So buy every day. There's a point. Every day the markets are not going to rally. They won't rise. It's a step-by-step -step process and traders and viewers understand this very clearly. So look for small dips and then go long and don't expect the markets to reward you day after day, hour after hour. The trend will remain up. And for today quickly, Today is also the FNO expiry. Now, FNO expiry can behave very strangely, especially after an eventful month. So be careful on that. Okay, gentlemen, stay on. We'll come back to you and uh, get your specific stock trades in just a bit. Quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. This is Open Exchange. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV in Motilal Oswal studio. We got the market view from both our experts. Let's get the stock view then. Mitesh, you tell us, what are the stocks in your radar? Uh, good morning, Nigel. I have uh, more of buy calls today. A buy on HDFC Bank as it you know, managed to close about 1,800 finally. So, uh, 1,900 finally. So, you know, keep a stop at about uh, 1,897. Look for target of 1,950. A buy on Indus Tower once it crosses yesterday's high of 352 half, buy then with a stop at 348 and look for a target of 362. Also, buy on BEL with a disclaimer that I have some uh, bullish bias call spreads in the uh, position and we have recommended this to our client, so there is vested interest. But BEL looks like starting a trend which could see the stock price head towards 320, 325 zone, and this is a buy with a stop at 300. And one sell call on Dupin with a stop at 2041 for targets of 1930. Mm. Uh, Sudarshan, what about you? Well, it's an all buy list. Uh, there's one stock which has not corrected and has been outperforming performing as Grassim. So Grassim is a buy with a stop under 2500. The other three stocks have the same theme. They have gone through deep corrections and they are now like, presumably coming out of that deep correction. Trent is a buy with a stop under 6600. RT Airtel is a buying opportunity with a stop under 1500 and Tata Motors is a buy with a stop under 750. All three have the same theme, deep corrections and now some anticipation of a rally. Okay. Uh, got that. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, both of you, for being here uh, with uh, you know specific trades 
and of course, we own the Nifty as well. The first rates are coming through in the pre-open, but it's very, very early, so we'll give it a little bit more time. Half a percent lower on the Nifty uh, is uh, the first kind of rates uh, on uh, the screen. Well, let's uh, welcome in Chandan Taparia, Derivative and Technical Analyst with Mutra Roswell Financial Services. Chandan, good morning. Good to have you here. What would you recommend uh, viewers do? Uh, Chandan, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Good morning, Prasant. Thanks for having me. So we have seen a descent recovery in last three, four trading sessions where index has recovered by more than 1,000 points. Earlier, it had corrected from 26,277 to uh, 23,270 marks. And 38% uh, retracement comes at uh, 24,444. So that is a key level we are observing as of now. But the way price structure indicating some uptick, we are expecting this momentum to extend further. So as of now, till Nifty holds about 24,000, the ongoing bounce could continue towards 24,444 and 24,750 zone. So expecting some more recovery in the market led by strength and selective heavyweights and the banking name. Now talking about the Bank Nifty index, uh, Bank Nifty is holding well the key support of uh, 50,000 from last almost 36 trading session and now trading at the upper bend of the trading range. We have seen uh, improve in the data setup with surge in the put call ratio and a small follow up above 52,000 can take it to higher levels. So till it holds above 52,000, use that support to extend the rally towards 52,750 to 53,000. So expecting positive strengths in both the indices and there is a high potential that Bank Nifty could see some short covering as well as fresh buying interest in this market scenario. Now looking at the stock specific idea, first that is buy on BL. Uh, the stock is holding well. It has given a decisive breakout about 300 zone with some put writing and coal unwinding. The stock has been uh, stock has given a consolidation breakout of last 62 trading session and loans are being built. So expecting further up move towards 320, 325, one can buy with support of 300 zone. Second trading area that is buy on Biocon. Uh, technically speaking, it has completed a bullish pattern that is similar to cup and handle pattern, uh, which indicates further up move towards uh, 380. Uh, it has given a consolidation breakout of last 38 trading session and holding well above its falling supply trend line. So one can buy with support of 3848 for an upside target towards 380 level. Last trading area that is buy on SDFC Bank. The stock has entered into the lifetime high territory and has been making high top, high bottom. We have seen coal unwinding, short covering is also visible. So fresh momentum could be there towards 1880. One can buy with support of 1718 SDFC Bank. Okay, all right, Chandan, wishing you a good Thursday and a good expiry ahead. Thanks a lot for joining in. Let's turn our attention to the defense stocks then. They have staged a comeback in the last few days. B BEL, HAL, both of them have gained considerably in the last few trading sessions. And JB Morgan is positive on defense stocks as well. To discuss what's the outlook from here on, we're joined by Amit Anwani, the research analyst at Prabhudas Liyadar. Hi, uh, Amit, good morning and good to see you in as always, Amit. Well, some of these defense stocks, they cooled off a little bit. Case in point being an HAL, the last few sessions it's done well. Last six months, it's still down more than 10%. Do you think the stock price has cooled off enough? There have been various delays. You know, the 404 engines, that, uh, that, that, that order they were expecting, that has got delayed as well. What's your view on the stock at current reckoning? Do you think valuations are far more palatable now and you look to be positive on the stock? Hi, Nigel. Morning. And thanks for having me, uh, as always. And... Uh, uh, so, uh, as you rightly highlighted, uh, there has been a lot of correction, uh, which has happened. The stocks, uh, especially HL, has been sideways, barring the current moves, which has happened. And particular to HL, uh, at the beginning of the year, we started hearing about F414 uh, uh, engine delays. Uh, but now we are hearing that uh, this is the news report that uh, G might start delivering uh, one or two engines each month starting November. And uh, the, the, to recover uh, uh, for the full year deliveries, because the deliveries are delayed by at least 10 months uh, uh, basis, uh, the program. In my numbers, I am including uh, five deliveries uh, this year, uh, versus I think uh, largely it was expected that uh, the deliveries would be more than 10 uh, this financial year. So there's some little bit of cautiousness. Stock is corrected on my numbers. HL is trading at about 39x FI26 and 34 as uh, FI27. So having said that, I would be slightly cautious, at least for a quarter, to see that the engine uh, uh, supply chain is restored and they are able to recover and deliver more, though I'm not considering large number of uh, deliveries this year. 
but that is one event to watch. But having said that, uh, as I always reiterate, we are uh, uh, long term positive on HL. Any price below 44, 4200 buy dips, we uh, always recommend. And uh, I did upgrade the rating this quarter to accumulate with uh, roughly about 4700 target price. So, anyone having a long view, there's uh, uh, a correction which has happened in valuations. Uh, and especially HL without a near term cautiousness and long term view uh, can be looked at. Yeah. Uh, anytime the stock corrects to about 4200, you find that uh, as an attractive entry point, right, Amit? Right. So, what can happen is that if uh, what numbers I'm factoring in uh, the five to six deliveries, if they slip off, uh, there could be a seven, eight percent uh, uh, miss on execution, which can come. And uh, the, that uh, factoring in that, I, I believe that if that happens, the stock might still be sideways. But uh, once it uh, once the uh, engine delivery restores, uh, the GE has committed that uh, this is the articles that yeah. they'll try to recover uh, uh, the deliveries uh, in subsequent quarters. So I'm expecting maybe H2 next year could be lumpy in that sense if the deliveries still continue to delay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Amit, hi, morning. Uh, uh, what are the other ideas in the defense space uh, that you like? Right. So currently, we are uh, very positive uh, on the, uh, Bharat Electronics. We upgraded to buy the 340 again. Bharat Electronics uh, on my numbers is trading at about 34x FY27 and 39x FY26. Uh, uh, we are positive uh, because of two, three things. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the company continues to maintain uh, pretty strong uh, 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 numbers and executions on the back of very strong order book, which they have built in. A few uh, mid-size orders expected to come in, in radars and in electronic profile systems in upcoming quarters. Uh, management is very confident of 25,000 uh, intake this year as well. For me, the positive surprise which can come in next financial year, which is not included in the uh, order intake, is the QRSM order, which is very lumpy and has been delayed by one and a half years almost. Uh, there, the, the ticket size for uh, uh, Bharat Electronics could be as uh, high as uh, 12, 15,000, and maybe uh, it can be two uh, parts. So I think uh, that can uh, actually positively surprise on order intake next financial year, just like uh, it happened in FY24. So we can expect actually 33, 35,000 intake also if this order comes next year. So for me, that in, uh, further improves the revenue visibility. The company has been consistent. Uh, in, in delivering margins right. and uh, out, of the, ship, been, uh, out uh, of the three ship builders, yeah, got it. That's BDL. Yeah. Out of the three ship builders, uh, do you like anything? MDL, I'm I'm liking for a very long term perspective. Uh, uh, the numbers this quarter has been quite decent. So if you see overall defense, this quarter was. Uh, focused on execution because of the global supply chain for few companies and for few companies. Uh, since the few imported components are uh, uh, expected that there would be an impact. But we saw NDL also delivering decent number this quarter. Basis few orders like P75 deliveries uh, from the order book and uh, the Bravo orders and the three submarine orders which are expected to come uh, in next two financial years. Definitely, I see uh, with uh, three to five years uh, uh, top line growth, we'll see further uh, leg up if these large scale orders come. And uh, with that sense, I think MDL is one counter where uh, the, they are a kind of top one, two in, in making destroyer submarines, and there's a, a major advantage to this. Amit, so, MDL Amit, is definitely, I would prefer yes. MDL. Yeah. Uh, Amit, MDL, Mazgaon Doc, right? Yes, you're right. All right, I mean, you know, we're. Just wondering on that point. Well, thanks a lot, Avid, for joining in. Uh, you expect uh, things to look up here for a couple of stocks. Some of them have corrected from the top. But since valuations are far more palatable, Amit, more or less positive on the stocks with BEL being his top pick. It's 9.10. Let's get Sudarshan back on the show. Uh, Sudarshan, what's your 9.10 call? Well, consider buying Bharti Airtel with a stock under 1,500. Got it. Mitesh, All what right. about you? I'll go with BEL. I think that looks one of the... Uh, better picks and uh, as I said, I have some positions on the call spread side, so there's vested interest. But looks like it's heading towards 320 uh, to about 325. Okay, all right, uh, got that. Uh, thanks very much, Mitesh. By the way, UBS has come out with an interesting call on uh, Paytm. They like the story. Abhishek is here with the note. Uh, Abhishek, so what's the rationale? 
Uh, they don't like the story. It's just that they have increased the target price after the positives are factored by the street. So UBS has written on Paytm neutral rating target price increased to 1,000 uh, from 490 that they had earlier. They say that most regulatory issues are resolved and uh, positives are factored into the stock price. Uh, business performance improvement will be key going ahead. Regaining uh, two key points will be important for the company. Number one, customers. So monthly transaction users uh, regaining them uh, will be important. They are down 30% versus what they were before the RBI action. And also digital payment market share, it is now down to 18.5% from 24% pre-RBI action is what they say. So its uh, net payment margins are ahead of their estimate. Adjusted EBITDA break-even is what they expect in 4Q FI25. So they expect FI26 revenue to be on par with FI24 revenue that is at about Rs. 9,900 crores. Back to you. <clears throat> no, absolutely. Uh, Abhishek, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Well, there are a couple of other brokerage uh, calls we want to address. Uh, one is uh, Electronic Smart and the other is Aditya Vision. Aditya Vision uh, used to be on the SME board, uh, you know, a few years ago, came to the main board and uh, it's been one of the huge, huge outperformers. And it's multiplied uh, many, many times over. So let's uh, get down to this with uh, Mangalam. Mangalam, tell us. It's a big move that we've seen on both these stocks in the past uh, 12 months or so. And uh, Nuama has gone ahead and initiated coverage on both of them, Electronic Smart India and Aditya Vision Limited, as we're looking at newer ideas in the retail uh, sector itself. So Electronic Marts, you know, they have a target price of close to around 237 rupees, implying a 36-37% upside from current prices. They believe that the company's expansion into NCR, while there would be cutthroat competition, their market leadership and cash flow from Telangana could fund that expansion for the next few years, and that's a positive. They expect the revenues to compound at around 21%, but because of margin dilution from the NCR, they will have EBITDA compounding at 20 and uh, you know net profit compounding at 18% over the next three years itself. For Aditya Vision, however, the bigger trigger is replicating the success of Bihar into other Hindi heartland states. And at the same time, you know, the underlying macro trend of increasing penetration of consumer electronics in tier two and beyond cities. So they have a buy rating again with a target price of 672, implying another 36, 37% upside. And uh, they expect the revenues for this company to compound at 28% with margins to expand. So that means EBITDA compounds at 30% and net profit compounds at 41% over the next three years. So strong growth prospects for both these companies with uh, no overlaps when it comes to competition. And that's why they believe that these two are ones to worth looking at. Okay, interesting. We'll keep them on the radar. Manglam, thank you very much for that. We just have uh, about two minutes to go before the uh, you know day straight kicks off. Very flat, very, very quiet on the Nifty. It's not giving you away anything. The broader market is where the action seems to be this morning. The uh, mid-cap index is up about a quarter percent. Uh, by the way, a lot of the Adani Group stocks are indicating that some of that bounce back might continue this morning as well. Adani, Ports, uh, Green, Total Gas, between about 3% to 4-5% on each of these stocks. Ola seems to be starting positive, uh, so keep that in mind as well. Mitesh, uh, now, <clears throat> this is for the brave hearts, I mean, not really for the faint-hearted. Uh, okay, I don't think we have, Mitesh, because a lot of people have been sort of talking about whether you can take a short-term uh, trade on this rebound in the Adani Group stocks, whether that works or not. We'll see how that plays out. If yesterday's strength lasts into today or not? You know, uh, the one, uh, the, there are two nifty names. One is Adani Enterprises, the holding company. Yeah. The other is Adani Ports. Ports. <clears throat> and Ports, of course, is the cash cow of the group, right? Mm -hmm. And after the correction, I, yesterday I looked at the valuations. It's about nine and a half times EV beta. Mm -hmm. Average usually is about 12, 12 and a half. Mm. So it's actually, uh, and, and uh, of course, I mean, that is also the company which has not been uh, named this entire thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's uh, got some of the hardest ad assets, the you know the largest, uh, most valuable <coughs> assets. assets most of the group. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget so, ACC Ambuja, which oh, we yes. presented as yes, well. Yes, you know, yes, just yes. need a chip in there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll uh, uh, word yes. in for cement. Uh, we we got uh, market open coming up in just a bit. What the, the Nifty is absolutely flat, uh, twenty-four thousand two eighty. Uh, the Nifty Bank is starting slightly higher, about a quarter percent. Uh, Fifty-two thousand four hundred and twenty is where the Nifty Bank is at. Uh, so it's uh, slightly higher. Uh, at this point in time. Uh, what else? Small cap index is up a third. Remember, broader markets did very well yesterday. Uh, the small cap index, especially one and a third of a percent higher. You know, all these new age companies, uh, newer age companies, as you say, it's all relative, but you know, uh, Swiggy did well yesterday. The recent listing, Sigility, which works with insurance uh, ecosystem in the US, did well yesterday. Ola was up, locked up, limit up after uh, getting smashed over the last many uh, days. And of course, uh, you know, Paytm has been the other mover. 
uh, and uh, there was that UBS call which we highlighted as well. So uh, <clears throat> that's the start. 20 points, 24,300, around 24,300. I mean, it's good. You don't want a huge gap up or anything, and then you know you spend the rest of the day trying to defend it. A slow start, maybe even a slightly lower start, and then uh, if the market wants to move up, it gives more room. We've got, uh, <clears throat> as far as the Nifty heat map is concerned, 35 up and about 15 stocks which are lower. Uh, so it's a decent looking session uh, this uh, Thursday morning. Ola is up another 6%. After 20% yeah. yesterday, what a way to go for this one. Uh, and by the way, the Adani group that we were just discussing, the rebound on those stocks is continuing. That's the other major highlight of the morning so far. Stocks are rallying anywhere between 3% all the way up to 8 9%. Look at Adani Energy Solutions, Total Gas, Green, Adani Power, all of them. And the ones on the Nifty, Adani Enterprise and uh, Ports, uh, all of them. 2% to 10%, depending on which stock you're picking up this morning. Aside of that, let's talk about the big movers and shakers on the index itself. Lever is contributing, ITC is contributing, HDFC Bank, LNT, these are some of the heavyweights on the upside of the screen. HDFC Life is having a good start to trade today, almost a percent and a half up thereabouts. Sriram Finance, which has had a great week so far, uh, it's seeing some green at the start on Thursday as well, so not too bad. However, on the downside, there is a profit taking and a bunch of uh, tech names. Infosys is down. There is uh, Tech Mahindra also on the lower side of the screen. HCL Tech is a little lower. Reliance is very, very quiet. And auto stocks are seeing some profit taking. Aisha is down 1%. MM is lower. Bajaj Auto is lower, as is Maruti. So, auto not in top gear today. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> we got uh, so it's a, quite a start, and uh, but things may pick up as we go along. Uh, the first very rates up uh, on your uh, screens. Uh, at uh, this stage. What do we have? It's actually like a traffic light blinking red and green and nothing on it to uh, show for it. Uh, you know, so we'll have uh, uh, maybe a couple of more stocks uh, before we bring in our uh, market master of the day. Madhu Kela is uh, our market master. Uh, so we'll go cross when he's ready. Uh, we've got, uh, by the way, the, the top three, four uh, biggest volume-led movers are all Adani names. Adani Power is up 4%, Adani Green is up 7%, Adani Energy Solutions is up 7.5%, and Adani Total is up about 7%. So it's day two in terms of repair and recovery as far as these group of uh, stocks are concerned. I can spot names like Garden Reach ship, uh, Shipbuilders. We were just having that defense discussion earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, Cochin Shipyard is up about 5% or so. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it's not a bad-looking screen uh, at all. Madhu Kela is now with us, founder of NK Ventures. Uh, he's our market master of the day. Madhu, great to have you back on the program. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Prashant this side. Uh, Madhu, since we're talking after a while, uh, it would be good to sort of get... Okay, I think the connection dropped. Uh, we'll just have him back uh, in a bit. Surabhi, you want to add something? Yeah, in the, in the meantime, I was just yeah. looking at some more stocks. Remember, a lot of these companies that have announced order wins. Look at KAC, International, Hoodco, NBCC. All of them are up and about. Some stocks that are reacting to news flow. So all the order winners are doing well, 3% to about 6-7%. Uh, and uh, there is also PCBL. PCBL has got uh, the allotment of uh, some SEZ land. In I think it was in Andhra. Uh, that's a stock that's reacting quite well to that development, 3-3.5% three, three up. So these are some of the newsmakers doing well. But yeah, I mean, the, the morning really belongs to the Adani group all over again. Those stocks doing really well. You know, HBL Power is up. Uh, it was up about 6-7% yesterday. It's up another 2.5% this morning. Uh, and uh, we've got, uh, you know, Irida, which is up 4%. I mentioned Garden Reach and Cochin Shipyard. I mean, usually always move as a pack. And Tube Investments was a big mover yesterday. It's up another 2%. Afcon sold off a little bit. It's up 2 2.5%, 3 there's Capricide Infra, uh, which has been doing well. It's recovered nicely from the lows. Uh, it's up about 2% as well. There's Shilpa Medicare, which is up about 1.5% as well. So there's a fair bit happening. Two, uh, three is to one in terms of advances to decline. But this is still very early, right out of the gates. So maybe yeah. uh, 15, 20 minutes more, and uh, we'll have a better sense. Madhu Kela, founder of MK Ventures, is with us. Madhu, great to have you with us here uh, back on the program. It's been a while. So it'll be uh, helpful uh, for our viewers. Madhu, if you update, your kind of setup and your thinking on the market now? Because, you know, we we uh, went through the first 10% plus fall on the Nifty and it was a slightly bigger fall than we were used to over the last three, four years. Is that now largely behind us, you, you think? Yeah, Prashant, uh, good morning and thank you for ha having me again on the program. It's always nice to uh, have interaction with you guys. I would say the market setup... Uh, Prashant is quite constructive. 
there was some sign up some kind of a you know euphoric movement at least in some sectors and uh, some companies and uh, even though you mentioned the nifty has corrected by 10% but there are a lot of these kind of stocks which have corrected even up to 50 60 70 40% so to that extent there has been a very good uh, very good moved uh, in in these stocks to consolidate them that is the point number 1 the point number 2 that you know market is extrapolating a lot this last two quarter performance of the corporate india we have to view it in the context that the government expenditure was relatively lower because of elections and other issues uh, possibly bigger heat uh, this time so the fiscal deficit even up to october month was only 30% so the, i think once the government expenditure picks up and the money really starts to trickle down uh, the uh, the corporate earnings which is the really heart of market should pick, uh, should really pick up uh, in the next uh, two quarters right It's starting this quarter and whatever channel checks which we do prashant you know talking to companies it's been quite positive month of october and even november uh, till date so i think corporate earnings should be should be positive third the biggest positive in my mind prashant is you know uh, which market somehow is not talking as much is the formation of the trump administration's people if you look at the choice of the treasury secretary and you look at his views on india go back to his uh, you know whatever whatever publicly he has spoken he is a very practical person he used to be a hedge fund manager so i think this will go down very very positively for india while there will be tariffs uh, possibly across the world and much higher tariff i don't expect uh, you know any massive tariff because india is a natural ally to the us and lot of their businesses are also dependent on our services uh, back from here so that will naturally give india some kind of a advantage uh, going forward you seen what they are talking even they are talking of tariffs on canada and uh, mexico to the extent of 25% so if india can manage this well so our position geopolitically uh, should improve quite as i have already improved quite well and our business with us should substantially go up right and i'll just give you uh, i've given uh, some data points if you can put that across just to prove my point you look at the cdmo business right it is roughly 200 billion dollars uh, worldwide and there is a break up of uh, what is there in india right now it is only 7 billion dollar out of 200 billion dollar it's projected to go to 300 billion dollar these are data even before that so i am just saying india is anyway going from 7 7 to 14 but mind you china is is projected to go from 25 billion to roughly 45 billion dollar prashant is some amount of that incremental growth also comes to india let's say if you are able to garner 7 billion dollar of more business then a industry like this can grow maybe 300% and given geopolitical situation and given where china is i have no reason to believe that the chinese companies can continue to grow uh, uh, their businesses in sectors like this so this is just a case in point as to what is it which is lying ahead for indian corporate and indian industries vis-a-vis -vis, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the us so i am quite constructive and uh, positive prashant on the market on a bottom up basis and uh, i would look to buy uh, uh, every dip one more point which i want to mention prashant that we have seen many events in the last uh, one one and a half year specifically we have seen us election we have seen indian election we have seen some kind of a, a scare that money is going away from uh, india to china we have seen uh, uh, you know uh, uh, two or three wars in the world israel uh, uh, israel and iran war we have seen russia ukraine war and market has gone through a lot but if you look at the resilience of the market it gives you a lot of confidence that in spite of all of this chaos nifty has only corrected 10%
which is which sure. is nothing after going up uh, so much so which is which means that every uh, dip is being bought in the market by the retail investors absolutely madhu you said it it's just that you know uh, the market here got used to corrections being only 2 3% so then relatively 10 seem like a lot but you're absolutely right i mean what is 10% in a market that's been going up uh, consistently that's getting so much of money 40000 crores coming into mutual funds every month so absolutely take that point now you know we'd love to discuss uh, those bottom up individual stock ideas with you but we can't because of you know regulatory reasons like you say but uh, i just want to get your sense on two or three of the hottest themes in the market and this is not for, from today's perspective these are big themes in the next couple of years right one is obviously energy transition and whatever is happening in renewables we were just speaking to borisel glass i mean a while back so that's one renewables and energy transition the second is uh, you know semiconductors and we know a lot of companies have been setting up capacity on the semiconductor side and the third say is uh, you know uh, is ev uh, which is also something sort of very very prominent so these are three new futuristic themes and at the same time you if you look at the old economy you look at traditional power as well even there there's a lot of capex that's happening now just help us understand that say from a three year perspective which of these three themes they're all strong they all have a future but which of these two three themes are you most bullish on so i would say that you know the uh, you know my views on energy transition we have spoken in the same channel many times see this is here to stay now because this has become commercially viable this is not based on subsidy we are not talking of solar power or wind power 10 years back there is substantial amount of subsidy was needed for them to become viable they have become viable on their own and it is inevitable given the climate change which is happening in the world regardless of who comes and not comes you know this transition is inevitable and it is happening and it is going to happen so energy transition really and ev is a part of energy transition is it is a is a subsector in the energy transition so i remain i repeat again i remain extremely positive on this team i just like to go back you know if in year 2000 i identified internet is going to do what internet is going to do to the world right i would not have to do anything in the markets because more than 25 trillion dollar of wealth got created by that one word internet whether you talk of google apple amazon every, everything it came it came uh, from there right i think energy transition is a very powerful theme and it is going to last for next 10 20 years right now we are at a very early stage only 14 15% of the overall energy has transited to the new sources and the clean sources of energy and if you look at the past many transition uh, of energy up to even 60 70% of the new energy gets into the play so we don't know where this number is going to go but there is still lot of legs to this and there are various way ways to play this in, in the stock market we spoke about it you know we we played it even through a transformer company because it's yes. a it's a part of this overall energy transition as a theme so i remain very positive i think semiconductor we are still at the early stage it is is a medium to long term i would say that thing to play minimum 3 to 6 years i uh, i i can't see imminently any company really uh, benefiting a lot in the next 3 years out of the semiconductor boom in india all right uh, hi madhu good morning always good to see you been sounding very bullish you know the last time we spoke you were sounding a little bit cautious but i think you're very happy to see that correction that we got and now you're going full throttle in now we've discussed a few themes you know the transformer segment uh, trial i recall you all got in very very early and you all played that theme well dawa we discussed the pharma space cdmo opportunity let's talk about daru you know that's another space that you all have got bang on and there's big potential you know penetration consumption if it was a friday i would ask you if i could come across for a drink as well what's your view on that segment you know what are the themes you are playing over there <laughs> Nigel we have a uh, very constructive uh, you know thematic view on this sector uh, even though we have spoken at the cost of repeating I'll repeat once again <laughs> see india is a very young country and uh, consumption of liquor is going to be uh, a, a kind of way of life we can't uh, uh, you know uh, we can't help it in a, in a way and uh, it has happened worldwide let me give you some numbers 
Nigel. You know, there is one company in China, uh, Motai, which makes 15 billion dollar profit every year. Only one company. Eh? Total Indian liquor industry's profit, listed companies and including Parno Record, is only 500 million dollar. I repeat again, all industry profit is 500 million uh, million dollar, and one company makes 15 billion dollar profit in in China. So. That speaks about the kind of potential which lies ahead for this business. Why this was the case? Clearly, you know, a lot of money was being made by not the government, but by, uh, by I would say, you know, other people who were benefiting out of the policy restriction which was there. Take an example where the reform has happened. Take, for example, Uttar Pradesh. Their excise revenue used to be 8,000 crores in year 2011-12. It went to 17,000 crores in year 2017-18. Last year it was 50,000 crores. Nigel, it used to be 5% of UP's budget. Now it is 10%. Because the government has come out clean, they have, they have cleaned up the whole industry and the state is benefiting. Same thing now we are seeing happening in Andhra Pradesh. I think we are living in a digitized world. This level of corruption cannot sustain in other states and other states will have to follow suit that is my bigger call and once the profitability starts to get organized a lot of the companies will make much larger profit so it's a very big thematic call for uh, for us and we are well invested as a matter of disclosure i must say we are well invested in this sector right <clears throat> no absolutely i think tilaknagar radico uh, some of these uh, names that uh, you guys have been invested in for a while. So, yeah, absolutely, a full disclosure there. Madhu, uh, the other uh, pocket, right, where, where in terms of news flow, uh, which which uh, which came through was, of course, this entire Adani group uh, uh, saga, which kind of, in a way, played out again. Uh, to, uh, yesterday, we saw some repair and recovery. Today, again, we are seeing some repair and recovery. What is your own, what is your perspective on the matter? Do you own any of these names? Have you uh, bought anything during this uh, this this fall we've seen? Uh, again, as a disclosure, I must say, and I want to make this point, uh, Prashant, we have had this discussion in the last three or three times. Unfortunately, these events have happened, right? So I must say I am a very, very big believer in Gautam Bhai. I have personally known him for many years. I think they have built some fabulous businesses, the largest port in India, the largest energy company in India, the largest transmission company uh, in India maybe one of the largest cement companies in India. So th these things take, uh, you know, a lot of effort to, to get here. And I am a big believer in the capability of the group. I am invested and I have bought more in this fall. I want to be making very clear that and these kind of events, you know, in a large corporate life, these kind of events will happen. And I f frankly do, do not see the reason for this level of panic because of the case uh, which is being pointed out and so many more learned people than me including the uh, uh, lawyer fraternity people from the uh, from the us have come in their uh, your own channel and have said the what is the merit of this case so i think this is uh, this is just a passing phase in a large corporate life and it they will get through it and uh, i am sure as they came through, even the Hindelberg, much stronger. I have no doubt uh, that they will come out much stronger as a group from this event. Okay. You own uh, uh, some of these names and you've bought more in this recent fall uh, as well. Madhu, it's a, a pleasure. Thank exactly. you very much uh, for exactly. uh, joining us and uh, running us through uh, all of that perspective. It's always a pleasure. And uh, hopefully we'll speak once again before the year closes out. And we'll talk about the year ahead. Thank you very much uh, for being here on CNBC TV 18. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's move on then. And let's focus on the real estate sector. Prestige Estates, that's a stock on our radar. Morgan Stanley, they're a little bit bearish on the stock. They've downgraded the stock. Now, till the first half of the year, the company has achieved only 29% of their FY25 sales target. To discuss how the second half of the year is panning out, we have Mr. Irfan Razak, the chairman and managing director of the group, who joins us. On the show, um, hi, Mr. Rizak. Good morning, and always good to see you. When, well, you know, let's get straight to the point. In the first half of the year, you have done close to around seven thousand crores of sales. 
and your guidance, I think, for the year is around 24, 25,000 crores. You were sounding confident, second half of the year you're going to make up. Do you stick to that guidance? 18,000 crores is possible in the second half in terms of pre-sales? Uh, good morning. Actually, we are very, very confident, not only sure, and we are very sure that we will do this. Mm -hmm. See, you must understand that real estate has its own regulatory issues. You need to get your approvals, you need to get the RERA numbers, and you need to bring the inventory to the market. So if the sales have been a little low in the first half, it's not because of want of demand, it's not for the want of uh, uh, any, um, uh, you know, sort of customer interest. It's just because the interest is there, the demand is there, It's and we are also raring to go. But the important part is we have to follow the regulatory, and we are trying hard to see that we get the inventory into the market. We have almost 50,000 plus crores of inventory in the pipeline in different stages of approval. And once these gets approved and they get the RERA number, this will come to the market. And as our company, usually the thing is that whenever we bring the uh, inventory to the market, it gets lapped up, it gets sold off. There's a big pent up and we can feel it uh, because there's daily uh, people reach out, including to me directly, not only to my people, so, the, you know, they are interested in the various products that are there. They, everybody in the market knows about it. Now, if somebody could, can't understand that, it's a little sad because as far as we are concerned, we are still sticking to our 24,000 crores uh, uh, guideline. And even if this quarter is a miss, but the final quarter will be fully done uh, because we do have a lot of pipeline and we do all have a lot of traction and uh, the right product also. So we've got, uh, uh, starting from Delhi NCR, Indrapuram, we've got uh, Hyderabad, we've got Bangalore, we've got Goa, we've got Chennai. Now, even Chennai, my plans are just about to get uh, 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 approved. So the, the, even when that comes in, it's a big ticket uh, development. Delhi is a big ticket development. Bangalore, we've got a large development coming up, uh, which is the right uh, to the right target audience. So all this will add up. And I see uh, in no anxiety whatsoever for us to reach that target. And I do believe that all this will fall in place. It's only a matter of time. So, Mr. Razak, you're saying that uh, it might not happen in Q3, this pickup, but Q4, you will make up for everything, right? Uh, could you, uh, could you tell be, us? Yeah, it will be a combination of Q3 and Q4. Uh, we were trying hard to see that it doesn't get pushed to the Q4. Uh, but uh, the Q3 also, there is enough uh, that we are trying to, at least at November, December, November is almost getting over. At least now, the last uh, month, we, we believe that we can, if I can launch two, three projects which are in the pipeline, uh, that will boost up the entire demand. So whatever inventory we have, we are selling very well. And uh, I don't see any doubt for uh, reaching these targets. And this, of course... Uh... The back uh, no, ended in Q4. Yes, tell me. Okay. No, so just was trying to understand your projection of 24,000 uh, crores for this year. Uh, does this also include, uh, uh, you know, any of the sales from some of the marquee projects that you're doing here in Mumbai? I'm not sure what the timelines are for the BKC one, for the Mahalakshmi one, and also Aerocity in Delhi. So does this year's target include these three or will they flow into next year? Any BKC, Mahalakshmi, and the Aero City, we are not selling. These are Apex uh, projects. Uh, BKC is an office project. Mahalakshmi is an office project. And the Aero City is a, a, a country's uh, largest convention center, hotel built, being built in Aero City with a 600,000 square feet of office. That's why we need to look at the company comprehensively. We're just not a residential company. We've got office, retail, resident, uh, and uh, also... Uh, we have a hospitality. So there are many things that we are doing and doing it well. That There are teams out yeah. there who are slogging it out and making sure we succeed, including the Aero City Hotel. We are working hard to see we beat the timelines. Uh, but of course, now the situation in Delhi is we've got grab for work has stopped. So it will be at least at least a few weeks before we restart. So, But then uh, I am very confident of what we are doing. Uh, we have the finances tied up. We have everything ready. And I do believe that uh, uh, even the residential market is pretty strong. Uh, the demand is there. And I don't see any reason for us to feel uh, any sort of uh, 
flutter or worried about that, okay, there's no demand, there's no sale, uh, maybe uh, we don't have the bandwidth. We have the bandwidth, we have the people, we have the brand, and we will definitely <laughs> get the numbers. No, no, you definitely have all three or four things that you said, Mr. Radha. Good morning, uh, Prashant. Yes. It's always good, good morning, to speak, speak to you. Uh, no, no. I don't think anyone, by the way, uh, has, has any doubt that uh, all those things are, uh, and you've executed well over the years, right? Uh, I just, uh, you know, in NCR, uh, Mr. Razak, if you can tell us, uh, you know, how hard will you press the pedal? I was talking to a Delhi-based developer, not, not the obvious large one, but uh, and it was, they were talking about, you know, Godrej being there, you were there, uh, some of the sort of non-Delhi uh, uh, sort of real, real estate companies being there. Uh, and they were talking about land prices actually in, in comparative bids going up. For example, in Noida, this uh, person was pointing out, in one sector 151, there's a large land parcel coming up for auction. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, comparative intensity in that sense has uh, gone up. You can just uh, tell us if you're participating with that specific bid, will you or, uh, or not? And, and, and generally, how hard will you go in the NCR market? See, now, as, this, as it stands, I have got uh, two very large projects in NCR. Uh, one is the, in the prestige city, Indrapuram, which we are planning to launch in December. And that's a, a 10 million square feet of uh, residential uh, with a business value of almost 12,000 crores. And uh, we also have the sector 150, which has been lying there for some time. And I'm sure that will see the light at the end of the tunnel very soon. Uh, even that could come, if not this quarter, the next quarter for sure. So uh, we are not doing business on a compulsive manner that we have to get this pipeline and we can, or whatever, come what may, we will bid. So that's not been our style in whichever geography we are in. We look at the math, we look at what is a sensible final number that the product can be sold, what will be our cost, and then we uh, calculate our math backwards. Opportunities are there in plenty. Uh, we evaluate each opportunities one by one. And uh, we don't believe just going whole hog all over the place. Uh, we will at least try and see what we've got on our plate, launch it, feel the market, get a sense of how things are today. The sense is very positive, uh, but then nothing proof of the pudding is always in, in the eating. And we are trying to see that we launch this, see the demand, uh, see what how it's received and how the market behaves. And based on that, we, we will uh, try and commit some other deals. There are many in the pipeline. Uh, but uh, we are not overly anxious, nor are we uh, compulsively trying to do work in whichever geography we are, and we will pick up land at sensible numbers. Okay. Uh, for that uh, one sector 151, Noida, would you be participating? Uh, my team is, will be definitely working on it, and okay. uh, the, the, the paper will come up, and then we'll see at what numbers we can go at. All right. Uh, Mr. Razak, uh, it's a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And uh, it's good speaking with you and getting a sense on, of what uh, Prestige is uh, doing out there in the marketplace. So very confident of achieving the full year numbers, no doubt at all. Well, let's uh, focus on the next company. Suprajit Engineering is on the radar. The company signed a MOU with a Japanese cable maker uh, to design, manufacture and supply transmission cables in India. Uh, let's talk about uh, this and more uh, business developments. Uh, K. Ajit Kumar Rai is founder and chairman at the company. He's with us now to take some questions. Mr. Kumar, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Prashant, this side, uh, could you uh, give us a sense of uh, the uh, joint venture? Uh, how much investment are you putting into this one? Uh, and uh, what is the size of the market uh, that you hope to capture with this? Good morning, and thank you for having me on your channel. Uh, we just have announced... Uh, an MOU with the Chuo Spring Company in Japan. Uh, Chuo is a market leader in specialized springs, actually. They are into suspension, suspension springs, you know, uh, engine wall springs, et cetera, et cetera, and supplies to most of the Japanese uh, OEMs. And they also have a cable division, uh, and uh, they also supply to the Japanese OEMs in that space. We are particularly are, uh, interested in through this joint venture to manufacture transmission cables in India for the leading Japanese OEMs. As you know, Suprajit has the limited uh, exposure to the Japanese, uh, the, the two major Japanese OEMs directly in India, although we supply to them and, uh, as a tier one, tier two supplier. But as an OEM, I think the transmission cable is one of the key products which uh, we do not supply. 
and I, you know, these uh, Chuo is a supplier of these products to these two companies in Japan and elsewhere in the world, and okay. that's the right way to enter the OEMs. I think that's why this uh, deal has been struck. The collaboration finalization is going on. I think the investment details will come up probably a little later. We're in the process of establishing a JV company in India at this moment. And mm. we believe that in the next few months, we will be finalizing all those things. So this is going to be sold, uh, these transmission cables will be sold for cars, uh, I mean, Honda, Toyota cars in India or around yeah. the world from here? Um, the starting point is the Indian uh, two major uh, OEMs, uh, Maruti and Toyota. And of mm. course, eventually as a joint venture, you also you look at other transmission cables for other customers as, as well. Okay, all right. Hi, Mr. Rai. Good morning. Nigel on this side, and good to see you in. So just to understand, you're not making these sort of cables in-house as of now, right? We do make, but we don't really supply to any Japanese uh, manufacturers it. as such. Uh, but it's mostly what we make is into the non-automotive and heavy trucks industry. The okay. passenger vehicles, we have had very limited exposure. Okay, so it's giving you a, a bigger exposure to the select clients that you have mentioned. So, uh, you know, you're, you're getting access to this clientele. Got it. Could you give us an, uh, some more details about this arrangement? What is the revenue sh sharing between both the two entities, the Japanese entity and y'all? Will there be some royalty payment? And if we could just outline a broad capex that y'all have in mind, what is the normal asset turn that you could look on at this? Again, some of these details are yet to be finalized. I think what we are trying to do is to bring their very specialized transmission technology to India and make mm -hmm. India as a manufacturing base for the transmission technology for both the partners. I think the idea is to, of course, approach the two major customers, as I said, but eventually is to approach the whole global market and see how this joint venture can support uh, the specialized transmission cables to other customers as well. In terms of the details of this, I think uh, we will be, you know, starting obviously for the domestic requirement and uh, we'll scale the market as required. The details of the financial part of it is, although it's internally been worked out, we will probably inform uh, more probably at a later stage. At this moment, it is still under finalization. There will be some royalty payment, right? Yes, there will be some royalty payment. And a rough quantity? That is a standard for any joint ventures anyway. Yeah, a rough quantum, what could it be, the rough range? Again, you know, these are all, we are under NDA to disclose all these matters. But, you okay. know, it's probably, basically, we will be doing what the industry standard is in royalty payments. It will not be okay. any different. All right. Let's uh, talk about other businesses. Then once you get further details on this, we'll reinvite you on the channel and we'll get an idea about CAPEX, you know, royalty payments, asset turn as well. Now, you have a fair bit of exposure to the export market and we're getting mixed commentary from a lot of auto majors. What is your sense? Are things on the mend? Are those supply issues, uh, you know, getting sorted out? And do you expect recovery from year on, quarter three and quarter four? Yes, I think uh, the global market is certainly tepid. Uh, you know, both Europe and US, even Japanese, China markets are pretty weak, I must say. Uh, the global geopolitical uncertainties are not helping at all. Having said that, I think, you know, despite, you know, some of these big automotive guys have even talked about plant closures, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. It doesn't seem to be affecting us too much. I think our controls division, which operates outside of India, is mm. still having a good traction of business. And uh, mm. we seem to be growing the business despite the market is not growing. So for us, it doesn't seem to have a big effect. But uh, yes, the market is in a turmoil at this moment. Mm. Mr. Rai, uh, what's the export share, sir, the business? I think 52% of our business uh, is outside of India. I'll say 50-50 between India and outside of India. And how much is it in the US? I mean, how much do you, 52% uh, would you sell in the US? Uh, of the 52%, I would say, uh, yeah, 50% will be in the US. Okay. You, uh, uh, the, these tariff uh, threats, etc., will that hurt? Or you think uh, the sectors that you're operating in, uh, not really, would it? Any thoughts at all? Um, you know, we have to still wait and watch exactly what tariffs will be, uh, be done. But please understand, it will be affecting uniformly all component suppliers. And I suppose when there is a uh, tariff issue, uh, which, is, uh, which is sort of enforced, uh, you know, uh, by the uh, local governments, we'll end up going to the customer only, right? So 
that you know for us it's uh, eventually going to be passed through although you know in the initial stages there will be some kind of a hard bargain to be struck with the customers mm. all right let's talk about a couple of your segments then sir before we wind up scd segment margins it's all sharp contraction in the past quarter on scd what is the sustainable margin if you could help us out and the acquired ses segment you know out there you had a huge negative ebitda margin i think it was around 15% but you were saying that sometime in fy26 maybe towards the end it will turn around do you stick to that scd as well as ses give us some color actually i don't know where you got the controls division number but actually our controls division number margins have improved last year for the first half we were at about i think 4 or 5% it has increased to 8% just to give a overall color globally auto component industries operate in an you know in an ebitda margin between 6 to 10% we started mm-hmm. below 6% so and SC- we are now at scs sir i'm talking about scs or oh, you are talking about the airline. yeah scs uh, sir yeah. or oh, there that is still a negative margin the one that you acquired yes. and you were looking yes. at turning it around so scd yeah. i'm talking about some kind of margin pressure and scs which is the one that you acquired which are gradually going to turn around so give us some color yeah. on both yeah i am giving the color on the scd controls division uh, okay. there i said you know the margin is at 8% today which is uh, much better than what it was last year under 6% so there has been a significant improve in the scs that is scd the controls division performance as far as the scs is concerned i think we have made it very clear in the in our business update as well that it is a company that we have acquired from insolvency so obviously it has gone into insolvency because of the losses and obviously when you are turning around it takes some time we are giving i think two to three quarters for it to sort of stabilize and then start uh, turning positive so for the next i mean this and next couple of quarters there would be some challenges as we streamline the operations make sure that all the necessary you know customers are approached for price amendments and make sure that the supply chain is stabilized make sure the operational efficiencies are improved having a good exposure globally into cable business we feel that this is not a challenge for us over a couple of quarters and once that is done i think we expect the business to turn around and become a bit of positive so but the prop point here is that the strategic important of these assets today we are able to offer through these assets customers on shoring capabilities near shoring capabilities and low cost options from india and china i think we are one of the only cable suppliers in the whole world who are able to offer these three you know fully what i would say complete array of capabilities despite whatever the geopolitical scene is so we'll be the most uh, flexible suppliers for our customers i think that is the greatest advantage of these acquisitions mr rai we'll leave it there thank you very much for joining us it's a pleasure having you here on uh, cbc you. tv 18 thank you indeed well 20 points are higher so i mean actually with 20 points where are the days high Uh, so uh, you know that tells you the kind of uh, 40 45 minutes of trade that we've had so far 24000 just under 24300 on the nifty there you go that sharp spike that you're seeing otherwise we were flat to slightly sideways we take a quick commercial break here we're going to come back uh, and we'll have a discussion lined up on the auto space uh, you've got uh, ola electric you've got mahindra and mahindra's ev launches lots to talk about uh, and uh, we've got two gentlemen joining in to help us do that in just a bit Welcome back. Uh, well, you're with us on uh, Corporate Trader, and the next discussion is on the auto space, which has been really revved up of late. At least the stocks are, uh, you know, moving higher and higher. Uh, EV is in focus. Ola Electric and M&M both have come up with new launches, but the global EV market has been facing a slowdown, especially in uh, US and in Europe. Even in India, EV penetration remains fairly low. So, what are some of the key issues to tackle? What's the way forward for the Indian EV sector? We have with us. Arma Sorabji editor at Autocar India as well as MP Sham managing director at Akshay Motors gentlemen thank you very much for joining in uh, so Arma I I actually want to start with you to understand the market is getting suddenly very excited about Ola 
Uh, on one hand, obviously, Ola has been promising that they're going to fix their after-sales service and have a better sort of after-sales network, etc. Uh, on the other hand, they came out with these two, two new, new launches at far more aggressive pricing. Is this some sort of a turning point or maybe this is just the stock market getting a little ahead of itself? Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, looking at it long term, uh, I, I, I just think it's perhaps, uh, you know, you, you get uh, these, uh, let's say, uh, surprises from Ola from time to time. And of course, you know, these prices are absolutely fantastic, uh, really have the potential again to kind of, uh, let's say, turn the markets on its head, you know, 39, uh, 40,000 rupees, uh, as you've said over there. So very, very competitive pricing. Uh, but, you know, I think, uh, again, it's more a case of buying market share. Uh, I think long-term profitability is still an issue. For me, Ola is a company that um, isn't very uh, quality-centric. Uh, just that's the, that's the company ethos right now. We've seen it from the uh, customer complaints as well. Uh, I also don't see any fantastic innovation coming out of the company. Uh, quite honestly, we've got, you know, other competitors now getting into the space. Uh, we've had Honda, you know, who's uh, uh, la launched uh, the, the uh, uh, two products, one again with a swappable battery and one with a fixed battery. So, uh, but of course, I think, you know, Ola, uh, you have to hand it to them. Uh, they have the scale. Uh, they are the disruptors uh, in this space and they will continue to disrupt. Uh, but I think uh, long term, it's going to be uh, the companies with uh, the, the right quality, the right uh, engineering base uh, and, uh, let's say, uh, f fundamental uh, uh, engineering credentials that's really going to make the difference. So, you know, I and, and you can't rule out legacy players like uh, Bajaj Auto and uh, TVS as well, who are slowly chipping away in this space. But yeah, I think uh, this uh, is really a very uh, interesting and exciting uh, offering from Ola, no doubt. Uh, Horma, just, just to follow up on Ola, you raise concerns on whether they can be really quality conscious or not. Just on the pricing, uh, what they're talking about now, this price point of uh, you know roughly 40, I think 40,000 to some models going up to 60,000. Uh, does this look sustainable? Because what the company has been saying is that we're going to be making the battery packs internally. That's how we're going to save costs and then that's how we'll pass it on. Uh, so how convinced are you about this? And again, the same question, is it a turning point or is it too early to tell? Well, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it's too early to tell in, in my view because, uh, you know, there are certain costs uh, over there and, you know, the battery pack, yes, it is one component, but it's not uh, the one component that makes all the difference. Uh, it is a very expensive part of it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, we will be seeing technologies uh, evolving as well. Right now, they are doing the 4680 cell, which is a, a good cell, actually, is what Tesla also used. But I think, uh, you know, this technology is evolving very, very fast. And uh, over here, it's not necessary that someone who has a first mover advantage, you know, could benefit because uh, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, uh, I think in this space, uh, the battery technology, I mean, in, eventually people are even talking about solid state. That's still a long way off. But chemistries are evolving. Uh, you know, form factors are evolving. So I think uh, I, I think everyone will have a game plan. It's not that uh, you can't come into, uh, uh, you know, can't get into cell manufacturing. I'm sure a lot of companies do have that plan. And again, you know, it's the, the, the Tata Motors scenario, which, uh, you know, if you coming to cars, they've had a fantastic first mover advantage. And now for the first time, that seems to be threatened with the new uh, four-wheeler EV launches that are coming up. Mm. Okay, let's uh, bring in uh, uh, Mr. Sham into this discussion as well. Mr. Sham, uh, your quick thoughts on Ola and then we'll move to the other launches. I mean, M&M, that's, that's the other big one. I completely agree with Horma's view on uh, quality being a major aspect, which probably Ola has to look at. You know, price is one aspect of it, but the consumer also looks at, you know, how the quality is, how will the vehicle perform? Because when I, whether it's uh, two-wheeler, three-wheeler, four-wheeler or whatever product the consumer buys, he will see, the he will look into the quality aspect of it and he will also uh, speak to people who are already using it. So if the experience is bad, he's not going to buy it. You know, he's, he wants a robust vehicle, which is uh, should be value for money, but at the same time, highly quality in nature. Mm. Okay. Um, Harvas, to the larger point on EV penetration in India and adoption in India, uh, I think a fair amount of chatter has been uh, there on lack of charging infrastructure, affordability of vehicles. And now we are seeing this uh, big splash from Mahindra and Mahindra. 
So where are we and what do you see ahead? Just increased EV penetration. Do you think m and is going to be a turning point uh, when it comes to adoption here in India? I think, you know, it's not just m and We've got a lot of new launches next year. In fact, 2025 could be the year of the EV because you've got Mahindra, you've got Maruti, uh, Suzuki coming out, the market leader coming out. You've got Hyundai coming out with the Creta EV. Then you'll have Toyota following it up with another EV. You've got MG also, which has got a couple of EV launches. All this is definitely going to grow the market, uh, you know, despite the hurdles in charging infrastructure, which is turning out to be the single biggest problem right now. You know, we've seen the pricing, Maruti, uh, Mahindra have given some shock pricing uh, with their uh, B6E, which is, uh, you know, okay, they've given just the base version with a smaller battery pack. But again, we've seen, you know, it's very competitive as far as, uh, uh, you know, an ICE vehicle goes. And don't forget in SUVs, it's much easier to achieve cost parity because the delta in the GST is huge. You know, at the top end, it goes up to around 48%, whereas you just have 5% for an EV. So to bridge that gap, uh, you know, is, is I mean, to kind of, that gap kind of uh, really narrows uh, the, the, the on-road price. Plus you have the uh, local taxes as well, which uh, are waived off in the case of EV. So I think, um, you know, all this is going to really uh, enhance or let's say stimulate the uh, EV segment and the market. And quite frankly, also, there hasn't been enough choice. Uh, you've just had uh, Tata Motors, which has done a fantastic job, actually. They've they've kind of laid uh, the kind of uh, foundation, done a lot of groundwork uh, for the EV market. And, you know, they've, they've, they've ruled it. But I think now for the first time, there's going to be some serious competition. And uh, I think, uh, you know, customers are going to have some fantastic choice. <laughs> And that might kind of, uh, you know, let's say override certain concerns of charging infrastructure. You might, you know, the, the products are, can be very appealing where you say, okay, you know, charging infra, I don't mind taking a little bit of pain because uh, quite frankly, once you drive an EV also, very few people uh, want to go back to an ICE vehicle. So I think uh, 2025 looking overall good for EVs, my estimate is, uh, you know, sales will be, uh, two or two and a half to maybe even uh, 3x of what we have right now because even Tata Motors themselves are going to be launching a whole bunch of products like the Sierra EV, the Harrier EV. So it's going to be the year of the EV 2025 and uh, I think uh, that's really going to take the market uh, uh, a big leap forward. Uh, Harmoz, hi, morning. Prashant here. Uh, in terms of choice for consumers, will Tesla be in the lineup? Uh, there's, no, uh... I don't think Tesla is going to be coming for a while, uh, is my view. I think, uh, you know, Elon Musk has got other priorities uh, right now in the no, US. No, not, and, uh, not, to, not, not with the manufacturing set up here, but uh, with, with Trump by his side, better negotiate, better sort of, you know, negotiation. I mean, just to sell cars, not to set up uh, manufacturing here. I mean, do you think well, that's a possibility? Well, it could it could be a possibility, but it will be very low volume. I don't think he'll make a dent because really to be competitive and to address the mass market, you have to be locally manufacturing products over here. Uh, we've seen how uh, that's the only way forward. A classic case is what Mahindra done. Mahindra's done almost a lot of the bits are localized, uh, you know, except the cells, the motors. Uh, otherwise, everything has been done in-house. The entire battery pack actually has been designed and developed uh, in-house with, uh, you know, blade cells. So clearly, that's the only way to really get cost competitive and get the prices right down to an ICE vehicle where customers will be tempted to kind of uh, ditch their ICE vehicles and go in for EVs despite the charging uh, challenges. I'm thinking of buying a car and for the first time hearing Hormaz, I think I really need to test drive some of these EVs and wait, hold on to that ICE decision. You've completely convinced me, Hormaz. Uh, but uh, Mr. Sham, uh, I mean, final words with you. Uh, who would be the car makers or the bike makers to watch, uh, you think, uh, this year uh, as we look at uh, increased EV adoption in the country? Uh, there are nine, like Horma said, there are going to be 19 new launches in the year 2025 as far as EVs are concerned. And the big ones are going to be from Mahindra and uh, Tata's. And in the luxury, it's going to be Mercedes and BMW. And in the two-wheelers, it's uh, Honda, Eta, and Bajaj. Okay. All right, uh, sir. Thank you very much for the views there. Uh, Harma's great uh, talking to you as well. Thanks as always. Uh, and we look forward to how 2025 rolls on. Harma says it's going to be the year of the EV. All right. With that, let's uh, come back to uh, the market and get back to Mitesh and some trading ideas. The Nifty is managing to sort of slowly claw its way up. 
50 points higher on the index now. Mitesh, trading calls? Yeah. So I think, you know, one uh, on the Nifty, uh, we are again getting closer to about uh, uh, 24, 350, 360 zones. As I've been maintaining, I think that's an important pivot. So, you know, the approach will be to take some profits over there and then see if 24, 375 can be captured. Then you'll have an extension to about 24, 500 plus levels. So while you're positive, I think, you know, around this 24, 350, the advice is to play tactically, take some profits, and then get it again on a breakout or wait for a pullback. On the stock side, I have a buy on HPCL with a stop 375. Uh, would look for a target of uh, around uh, 400 over here. And uh, the second call, which I have... <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Yeah. The second call, which I have, is a buy on IOC with a stop at about uh, 135 half. Uh, look for targets of around 147 and 148 on the upside. Okay. HP and IOC, right? Two oil That's marketing it. names there in terms of uh, trades right now. Thanks very much, Mitesh, uh, for that. Uh, by the way, you know, in the lineup, there is, of course, all the Adani Group names and uh, some of the others we mentioned, like Cochin, Garden Reach, etc. This Bajaj Housing Finance as well, which was now there in the mix at 9.15, uh, it's up 5%. Uh, it's, of course, been a terrible performer since listing, uh, but uh, it's uh, sh showing some gains right now. We take a break. We are back with Manisha on the other side, Commodities in Focus. Welcome back. So the equity markets have managed a bit of green. Let's figure out what's happening in commodities. Manisha is with us now in the studios. Manisha, what's top of mind? Well, sugar, because after a very, very long time, we've seen some uh, movement come in for this one. If you look at the prices, well, we're trading at a two-week highs, the raw sugar prices, that is. Supply concerns is the major thing that is keeping the prices on the higher side. So when you look at the raws, 22 cents a pound is where we're trading on for that one. If you look at this year and the range therein, we've seen a high of around 24.4 and a low of 17.5. And we are trading at 22 at this point in time, so slightly on the higher side of the range. Well, the prices have gained 5.5% in 2024 till time. It has to do with the Brazil droughts, and that's impacting harvest, overall sowing. And Brazil, remember, is the largest uh, producer and exporter of sugar, and that's exactly where the prices are getting cues as well. 2024-25, well, you look at that season, Brazil, for one, is looking at a lower crop overall at around 39.3 million tons. Earlier estimates were 40.3. This comes in from Rabobank, but most of the numbers are around these as well. The other major producer is India, and as per the ISMA reports, we're looking at a lower crop around this time at around 33.3 million tons. The third largest sugar producer is Thailand. Now, this is where the surprise comes in from. You're looking at an 18% more crop as compared to last year. So that pretty much looks at the numbers that could get nullified there. There also is a very interesting report from City which says that we are looking at a big uh, deficit this year as well. So if this year we're looking at 2.3 million tons of a deficit, next year could be 1.3 as well, but deficit nonetheless. International Sugar Organization also has come out with their report and they're talking about previous year and this year. So last year, if you look at a production of 181.3, this year, we're looking at a lower global production at 179.3 million tons. So, well, yes, we're looking at a deficit in sense of production and the consumption is expected to go higher and that would keep sugar prices in support. Let's come to India then. And we are into a sugar crushing season right now. That seems to be gaining momentum. UP started way ahead. Karnataka also started in the month of November. Maharashtra, of course, was delayed because of elections here. But we do know and understand that more and more mills are now increasing momentum when it comes to crushing couple of things where that this industry is watching out for. One is the ethanol pricing. So even as cane crushing has started, we haven't seen a price revision in sense of ethanol that has been unchanged since 2022-23. Another thing that has been unchanged has been the minimum selling price of sugar. The last time we saw that one come was in the year 2019 at 31 rupees per kg. As of now, the cost of production itself is between 34 to 37. So this is another thing that the street is hoping would get changed. All right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, so that's commodities in focus. We take a quick commercial break here. Our special segment is the economy. My colleague Lata will be speaking with Samir Goyal of Deutsche Bank in the uh, if the rally in the dollar index has peaked. I remember last night, dollar index was down about 1%. Uh, we'll also, uh, of course, discuss uh, what next for US and Indian bond yields from here on. 
Stay with us.